Hey, Charlie, I just unmuted. Hi, folks. Let us know when you're ready to go, and I'll count to him. Thank you, ready. Recording okay. in progress. Okay, great. Um, all right, then I'll count to him, Bernard. We are recording to the cloud, so we will go live in five, four, three, two, one. Good evening. I'm Bernard Green, chair of the Brookline Select Board, and this is the meeting of the Select Board for March 19, 2024. Uh, let's start off with some announcements and updates from the select board. And I'd like to start, if you don't mind. Um, Sunday evening, I, along with a couple hundred, it seemed to me, other Brookline residents attended a uh, wonderful and informative event at Temple Sinai to break the fast that Muslim residents were on during Ramadan. I believe that uh, most, if not all, select board members were in attendance. During this difficult time of trauma and war in the Middle East, it was very nice to be able to gather as members of the three Abrahamic faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and others uh, to learn from each other and enjoy very relaxing fellowship. Um, I really appreciated uh, the, the synagogues uh, opening their doors and all of the people who attended. Um, and made that a, 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 a very meaningful event. The second thing I'd like to mention is that uh, later under miscellaneous matters, we will be pulling items 3C to 3G out and voting them at a future meeting because of questions concerning the notice uh, that the Building Commission uh, gave uh, for its meeting on March 12, at which these items were voted. The Building Commission will hold another meeting at a future date to revote these items and the Pierce School early demolition package. Prior to the Building Commission meeting, the Select Board will hold a public hearing with the Park and Recreation and Conservation Commissions. And following that hearing, those bodies will have their own meetings at which they will vote. Uh, their votes must be unanimous, and I've been given assurances that this will happen. Um, and we expect that, that it will. Following um, that, our project man manager left field can sign the bid packages and put together contractors, staff, and mobilized materials begin the process of demolition of the uh, old building on July, I think July 1st or somewhere around then. Uh, no one wants to put a roadblock in front of the Pierce project for, among other reasons, the impact that would have on the Pierce students who attend school in the Pierce building. And let's not forget those students who cannot attend Pierce School in the Pierce building because of their handicaps <clears throat> or other reasons that they can't attend a building that's just not appropriate for them. Plus, the impact on the next school project, uh, which you know, probably will be Baker. Speaking for myself, I'm committed to seeing the Pierce School project begun on begin on schedule with demolition starting uh, in July, 2024. But like many things in Brookline, this has been a difficult project, but we will ultimately prevail in my opinion. And the new peer school will open on time, <clears throat> though the delays and other obstacles may result in additional costs to taxpayers, but we will try to avoid that at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's the question. Uh, Paul. <clears throat> uh, Paul. Thank you, Bernard, for your for your comments. Um, I, too, want to um, first express my complete understanding of the anxiety and concern that's been generated from uh, the uncertainty and doubt about the process that uh, the peer school uh, planning uh, and demolition has been going through uh, the use of the, the peer school playground for um, uh, geothermal wells and some things that need to be passed for Article 97. But I too, first, I want to thank uh, Bernard, yourself, uh, and the town administrator, uh, Carrie Chaz Carrie, 
as well as the boards and commissions. I, I think I've spent two days on the phone with uh, a number of you uh, to try to work through the complexities of the issues. Um, and I just want to assure the Pierce community and the public uh, that um, we are committed to seeing this project through. It was approved by the, by the voters um, and the school will be built um, and we will do it in a timely fashion. And I personally am very committed uh, to seeing that happen, I think as many others are. So thank you. Thank you. Any other? Oh, Mary. Uh, Mary. Yeah. I mean, I, I just wanna say to, to reassure, I, with Paul and Bernard, Pierce is a priority for me. And I mean, that's it, right? We, we fought very hard uh, to get the uh, citizens to pass this. They passed it and we are going to build it. And I say that also as a person who personally cannot function in Pierce, as a, as a person who's hard of hearing, I've told this story many times. My very first meeting in the select board was in the Pierce library, and we had to move the entire committee out of the Pierce building because I could not follow a minute of that meeting. As an adult, with all of my assisted listening devices, my closed captioning on my phone, my nothing worked. So students most certainly should not be put in that situation. So you have our, you know, my, I can speak for myself like Paul and Bernard did. I am a hundred percent behind this. Uh, I wanted to clarify because I, I don't want to claim um, that I was <laughs> at the IFAR, which I greatly regretted missing. I, I, I didn't get to make it this year and I was felt very bad about that, but I had other, I had volunteer business in New York city. Um, and I hope to be um, present uh, next year. Um, I just wanted to announce a couple of things, uh, if that's okay. And one of them um, I think is very good news for Brookline uh, and for a lot of people in Brookline. And that is that we received word um, that the Chestnut Hill Realty uh, Pudding Stone development is now accepting applications for um, affordable units, um, dozens of them. And um, I think there's probably a, a lot of people in Brookline who will want to check out um, the news of that, um, that possibility and maybe even apply for one of the units. And the fastest way to get the information you need is to just uh, Google search CHR, which stands for Chestnut Hill Realty, CHR, and uh, Pudding Stone, which most of us are familiar with that terminology, but it's pudding like the pudding you eat, and it's stone like a stone, <laughs> a rock. And it's all one word, Pudding Stone. So CHR and Pudding Stone. And you'll see a great big splashy announcement about the new affordable one, two, and three bedroom apartments. Um, and so they're accepting applications. Uh, the website tells you, pretty much walks you through the application process, but um, they have also announced that there will be paper applications um, at the South Brookline Library. So I think um, there's, there's gonna be all kinds of ways that people can apply, and I think they should look into it if they're interested. Um, the other thing I'm going to do, and, and forgive me if I do this a lot between now and Marathon Day, but I just want to remind everybody that one of the best things about Brookline is Team Brookline, and um, one town, one team, um, a whole bunch of very, very admirable um, and you know people who you just have to stand up and salute them for what they're doing. Um, many of them, some of them, I'm gonna guess, will be running their first marathon. Um, all of them will be running a marathon for charity and the, the charities in particular, which um, um, connect with Team Brookline are local nonprofit charities, five of them. And um, sponsoring a runner uh, or sponsoring the team is add so much to the marathon experience because if you're used to sort of showing up to cheer on the runners, um, it's multiple times more exciting when you're looking for one runner or one team of runners um, to, you know, pass by um, on their way to the finish line. And you can become a sponsor of one of those runners or a sponsor of the team. And you can also support one of your favorite nonprofits in Brookline by just going to the Team Brookline uh, website and then you know just clicking through the process for sponsoring the uh, Team Brookline runners. Um, and those are my two announcements. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, uh, public comment. Uh, Charlie, do you wanna 
present the rules. For thing, Bernard. Thank you for joining us for public comment. This is an opportunity for us to hear your perspective on the issues in Brookline that matter to you. Each person speaking tonight is limited to three minutes. You don't need to use the whole time, but you may if you like. Once 15 minutes has been met, there is an opportunity at the conclusion of the select board's business for additional comments. Members of the public sometimes raise questions during public comment. We may be able to provide a quick answer to a question, but are more likely to work with staff to get a more thorough answer and provide a response over email. We'll let you know when you have 30 seconds remaining and when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks at that time. If you have more to say, you are welcome to send an email to board members expressing your thoughts in greater detail. And I would just like to preface that we have five people signed up for public comment tonight. Um, that will likely take full 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. And then three additional folks signed up for public comment at the end of the meeting. Um, if there is time at that point. So the first person signed up for public comment is Susie Ma. I believe she will be in person. Susie, you may approach the um, presentation station, the podium on the side of the room, and your three minutes will begin. Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Susie Ma. I am a Pierce parent. I have two kids who graduated and one who is still a student there. Um, I am gratified by your comments. I think you've heard some of the concerns already, and I appreciate the actions you've outlined in moving forward. Um, I did. I especially appreciate the direct support from Miriam and Bernard and Paul. I would like to, I'll just truncate my comments and just go on the record with what I was going to say. Uh, I want to, I think you've heard the frustration with the, the Pierce renovation project, you know, the joy that we felt last May when the ballot measure was passed and then feeling like there was just hurdle after hurdle to cross, the latest of which sparked this action was the building commission's failure to vote to release funding for the, the demolition last Tuesday, which we thought was going to happen, um, did not. And we, again, um, it just felt like the project timeline was being jeopardized, therefore the budget was being jeopardized, and the whole project was potentially being jeopardized. I felt even worse, so so I felt very frustrated about that, but then I felt even worse when I learned that there were other various commissions that needed, potentially their approval was needed. So the Parks and Rec you mentioned and the Conservation Commission. So I'm happy to hear that is lining up. Um, I will we'll hold you to, to that timeline and we'll, we'll be present and, and try to support that process moving forward. I again want to emphasize the 674 peer students and their families who do not know where we are going to school next year. This uncertainty is very stressful, not to mention the teachers, the administrators, and the staff who cannot plan for a move yet because we do not know if we are moving. So I would again just urge you to please keep to the timeline so we can move out in May and demolition can begin. Um, thank you for providing this timeline and the process you've outlined, and we'll just keep and we'll pay attention and we'll follow along. We appreciate your response to my comments and concerns. That's all. Okay, the next person signed up for public comment is Jeff Rudolph to speak, um, I believe, in person. Jeff, you may approach the presentation station. Otherwise, I will look for you online. Don't see you online. I'm here in person. Great, thank you. Yeah, I know. You made this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm in between my readers. It's for me. So it's we, need an extension. we need an extension. All right, can you hear me? Is that better? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeff Rudolph. I'm a town meeting member of Precinct 6. Um, I am also a Pierce parent, and I will be speaking as a Pierce parent tonight. Um, I'm going to try to change what I was going to say. I'm very excited to hear what everyone just mentioned. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you, Miriam, for your comments. Um, that's wonderful to hear. Um, and uh, I'm going to add just a little bit of color that I think is, is also helpful for everyone to hear at this meeting and also around town. Um, I was uh, the former uh, override campaign manager last year for both the operating override and the peer debt exclusion. Um, I can't tell you how much I learned during the campaign about the complexities of the Pierce project. You know, we're built into the side of the hill. There's four parking garages underneath. We got to go across a busy street. We want to have geothermal, you know, wells to help our electric power. You know, th this is a very complex project. Why would we ever expect that 
building it would be any less complex. And in the last few days, I've learned so much, um, uh, as, as Paul also mentioned, about all of the different commissions, all the different votes that we need to have happen. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear that we're, we've got some direction and a plan. And what I'm really just asking is that we continue down that path. We understand everything we need to do. We make sure that everything gets noticed correctly so we have time to vote appropriately. Um, if there are any other questions from our fabulous boards and commissions who are full of very smart, very passionate people, care a lot about Brookline, you know, let's just get all of those questions out so we can talk about them. We've been talking about peers for five plus years now. Um, this is a wonderful project. It's going to help the town for a hundred years. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate your leadership. Uh, I look forward to hearing the next steps. Thank you. Okay, the next person signed up for public comment is Marissa Vogt. Uh, Marissa, it looks like is online. I'm promoting Marissa to a panelist. Marissa, you've been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video and your three minutes will begin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person. I'm uh, trying to watch my my kids. Um, I'm Marissa Vo. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 6, and um, I have a, a first grader at Pierce and a younger child in pre-K at BEEP. Um, and I, I just wanted to start by saying thank you to um, Chair Green and the other select board members for your statements of reassurance about the Pierce project um, just a few minutes ago. Um, I'll keep it really short. I was just going to speak to to um, ask you for exactly what you said to um, to commit to keeping the Pierce building project on on um, schedule and on budget, and to work with your commissions and boards um, to make sure that they have all the information they need to just keep having their meetings and keep moving the uh, the project forward. And um, you know, I just wanted to give a, a personal um, you know a personal note to this about the uncertainty. Um, about where the Pierce community will be next year. Um, it's not just theoretical or just about the impatience with the delay about where schools, um, when the school will, the new school will open, but this uncertainty about when we're going to move into the swing space actually really impacts my family personally um, because my to manage the two pickups and drop offs. Um, if my older child is going to be at Old Lincoln, we have to move our younger child to a different beep location. Um, and we'd rather not do that if, you know, they're not moving into the swing space. So, um, you know, it's, it, the uncertainty really is, um, impacting families. It's much harder on other families than uh, it is on mine and certainly on the, the teaching staff and the administration. Um, so thank you for, for listening to us and for, um, acknowledging our concerns and for committing to moving the project forward and, um, uh, have a great night. Thank you. Okay. The next person signed up for public comment is Dave Porter. Uh, Dave, it looks like is online. I'm promoting him to a panelist now. Dave, you have been promoted to a panelist. You can unmute and share your video and your three minutes will begin. Hi, uh, Dave Porter, Precinct 6, um, just adding my uh, the weight of uh, uh, my voice to the weight of all the other voices. Um, thank you for what you said earlier. Uh, please stay on track. And, um, you know, this is real important. I understand that it's real complicated, uh, but it, uh, and it's real important. So uh, keep it up and we'll keep watching. Thank you all very much. Okay, the next person um, signed up for public comment is Linda Palkin. Linda, I believe, is in person. I'm not 100% I'm not on that. But... Hi, Charlie. Yes, I am. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> now for something completely different. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Linda Olson Palki. I'm an urban planner, a town meeting member from Precinct 17, and I'm a member of the advisory committee on the land use subcommittee. And I wanted to be here tonight just to acknowledge the importance of the contract that's before you tonight to begin what I hope will be a transformational process for Brookline, namely our comprehensive plan. I want to thank everyone who has helped to get us to this point, most notably planning director, Kara Bruton, town administrator, Kerry, who saw the need and had the foresight to include the funding for this work in our most recent override, the staff and membership of the planning process study committee who drafted the request for proposals and the consultant selection committee. I wanted to remind the community about the individuals who drafted the process. 
that we're going to be undertaking. Uh, namely, John Van Skoyek, Mark Zarillo, Carla Banka, Felina Silva Robinson, Susan Podziba, Jonathan Klein, and Al Rain, and myself. And of course, Emily DeHogue, who did an incredible job as staff to that committee. I'm thrilled to see the collection of highly skilled professionals that has been put together by the agency to tackle this daunting task. Of particular note, I'm especially excited about the inclusion of Grayscale Collaborative. A few years back, I read about Mr. Grayscale's work in Alston Brighton, and what struck me about that work is that it focused on enhancing and improving the community for the residents that live there and building upon what social fabric, interests, and activities had already organically emerged by providing improvements that would matter to the community, improve opportunities without displacement. To be successful, we'll need everyone every segment of our community to engage in this process with an open mind, with respect, and with a willingness to learn and listen. With the high caliber professionals assembled here, we have the type of partners that can help us understand our options, highlight necessary trade-offs, think holistically, and hopefully bring us together around a realistic and inspirational shared vision. I do hope you approve the contract tonight. Thank you. Okay, uh, we still are underneath the 15 minutes that we would normally have uh, for public comment. So I think we can take one more uh, public commenter if they're if they're available. Um, one, the next person I had signed up for public comment is Liz Gorman. Uh, Liz Gorman, are you in person? We see Liz. No. Yes. No. Anybody? No. No. Don't see. We'll put, we'll come back. Okay. Um, I have. Uh, I'm sorry. Have uh, the next person signed up for public comment is Elisa Connor. I'm promoting Elisa to a panelist now. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to speak. Um, I anticipated Liz. Liz thinks that she's on for about 8:30 tonight, so I'm um, happy to jump in, and so she will say more about what I said. Uh, some things I refer to. So I'm Elisa Connor, Brookline resident voter, Precinct 5, property taxpayer, and parent. I also graduated from Brookline Public Schools, and I've taught Spanish at the high school since 2001. Around $3 million of cuts to our children's education is on the table, and I'm here to ask why. Why are there proposed budget school budget cuts the year after a successful override vote? Why is the town proposing to increase our already healthy reserve funds rather than fund the schools? Why did the town leave over five million on the table this year from pro potential proposition two and a half funds? And why has the town underestimated local revenues by millions of dollars each year for the past five years? So year after the year, the district claims a budget shortfall right about now, and this causes immense insecurity and demoralization among our educators. And I'm here to say that the austerity approach that is, seems to be driving the budget decision makers in Brookline threatens the stability of the workforce that cares for our children and threatens the quality of the education that we can provide. And none of this is inevitable and nor does it accurately reflect the resources in our community. So I'm calling for a fully funded school system with the K through eight world language instruction digital literacy instruction and literacy support that our students deserve. Those are the things that are some of the things on the chopping block. And so I urge you, my select board members, to investigate this manufactured budget crisis and call on the school committee to delay their budget vote, which is scheduled for March 28th, resolve this unnecessary budget crisis, find the funds. We can and we should invest the funds we have for the common good, including <laughs> schools. And now with my Spanish teacher hat, and you'll hear more about this from Liz later, um, but there's some hits that the K through five world language program is on the chalking block, maybe because it's not as effective as was promised, or it takes away from literacy and math instruction. Um, but I want to point out that the district has in recent years persistently undermined those teachers' ability to be as effective as they know how to be creating unsustainable workloads and driving numerous qualified you have 30 years away from Brookline. So it's not the program that we voted for that it could be. And even so, the program is a win for our children. 
Early language learning has immense benefits for young brains, and I can testify as a teacher that my high school students are reaching the levels of proficiency in language higher than I've ever seen in my 22 years here. So I'm here to say we can do better in Brookline. Let's do it. Postpone that school budget vote and fully fund the schools. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the 15 minutes we have at the beginning of the meeting for public comment. Other folks that are signed up will have a chance at the end of the meeting. Can I raise a point of order, please? There's no point of order at a select board meeting. I can't hear you. What? Yeah, there's no point of order at a select board meeting. This is a town meeting. I'm sorry. But you're welcome to email or call. You had one minute left. Would you have time within one minute to make a comment? You're happy. You're, we're more less than 30 seconds. Do it. Thank you. Yes. And it's a positive thing. I want to say whoever the gentleman is, every single week I come here two or three times, it doesn't matter at this hour, who does the lobby downstairs, does a first class job. And you should let him know that because it shines down there and it's vacuumed down there. And it's a very welcoming way to walk in the building. Thank and he's a lovely human being too, Regina. <laughs> Just a very, very nice guy. Okay. Uh, Chaz, did you want to add something? Sure. Uh, I got a lot of emails this afternoon. You too. Uh, yes. From... Uh, from folks and I don't and I don't want to be I, I want to first say um, that I don't want to be dismissive or uh, or or minimize the concerns raised um, by the um, um, by by folks who have sent those emails around about the school budget. But I also think that the message, while well intentioned, also reflects I think some confusion. Um, and I just wanted to set the record straight so folks have an understanding and we can move forward collaboratively. So I just want to read the email that I've sent in response to all 100 emails I've received so far, because I do take this very seriously. Um, good evening. Thank you for your message. Unfortunately, there seems to be some confusion or misinformation regarding the town of Brookline's budget and processes. I, as town administrator, have not proposed any cuts to the school's budget. I don't have control over the school budget. Uh, the school department and all of the municipal operations are funded through a mutually agreed revenue split with approximately 59% of all our revenue funds after shared costs are paid for going to the schools and 41% to be shared between all other town departments, such as public works, police department, fire department, so on. When the initial revenue projections for the coming fiscal year, which starts July 1st, were released, both the schools and the remaining municipal operations showed shortfalls. It means our revenues don't cover our projected growth and expenses. So that means both on the town side and on the school side, we need to make reductions to sustain our operations. The decision of what to reduce on the school side to balance the budget is a matter for the independently elected school committee, not the select board or my office. To the extent arguments are being made that Brookline's reserves are healthy or sufficient, that is unfortunately untrue. Brookline is one of only 13 AAA-rated communities in Massachusetts, and its reserves were recently classified by Moody's, the rating agency, as lower than those of most of the other AAA communities. This year, Moody specifically told Brookline that the town needs to increase its reserves from 10% to 20% of its revenues. We also have significant unfunded liabilities for our pensions, and other post-employment benefits like retiree health care. Only through extremely diligent planning and through the work of our Deputy Town Administrator, Melissa Goff, and our Finance Director, Lincoln Heineman, the whole team, have we been able to get in range of satisfying our pension obligations. And even there, we likely won't hit that goal until 2030 at the earliest, at which time we'll still need to address the even more underfunded uh, post-employment liabilities. Uh, our AAA bond rating is critical to maintaining our borrowing power and our low interest rates. Again, it may not sound like much on paper, but if we lose that, taxpayers pay more to service our debt, which is significant. And that means less money for the schools and other municipal operations at a time when costs are rising. I also want to point out we are not under projecting our income. That is incorrect. Where revenues come in higher than expected, we adjust our financial projections for the coming year accordingly. Recall, we cannot be over budget. We are not the federal government. We are not a private business. We are not allowed to run an unbalanced budget. Um, so when revenues go, look up, go up, we adjust accordingly. For example, local receipt revenues for things like certain non-property taxes went up significantly last year. On the next fiscal year, we're increasing the projections on that by 10%. But even then, that's still not enough to offset the growth in costs for things like healthcare and wages to pay our teachers and our other employees. But as I said, all of our municipal operations are feeling the sting of this crunch. The school department is not being singled out or having its budget cut by the select board. 
All of us are having to make hard decisions in an environment where expenses outstrip revenues to ensure that Brookline continues to provide the level of service its residents have come to expect. The town's financial plan for the next year is available online. Strongly encourage you and anyone else concerned about this to review the initial budget message, which makes up part one, discusses these cost drivers and how our revenues, while they're growing, aren't sufficient to meet them. It also talks about our policies with regard to one-time sources of funds and why even in years where we seem to bring in more than we thought we might, it's not appropriate to rely on them to balance shortfalls in our operating budgets. This was a major pitfall in the 1990s in Brookline that resulted in serious you know, dilapidation to municipal facilities, the loss of jobs when revenues yo-yoed. It was not a way to do business and it's certainly not a way for us to maintain the bond rating we need to keep interest rates low. So again, I really appreciate where this is coming from. I understand people's concern and frustration, but I want to assure you, this is not a manufactured crisis. It is not an attempt to undercut the operations of the school department. The superintendent and I work very well together. We don't treat ourselves as in competition with one another the way some other municipalities do. We thrive as a whole when the schools thrive, and we're committed to helping them do so through this challenging economic time. So again, I do appreciate the outreach and the concern. I've responded to every one of those emails but I want to be sure that people understand this is not something manufactured. This is a tough economic time. We're going to get through it, but it's going to take work. So thank you. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, next, uh, our miscellaneous agenda. Renata, can I just add one thing briefly before we go on? Okay. Um, I, you know, um, I, I give uh, Town Administrator Kerry tremendous <clears throat> credit for his measured response. I don't need to be so measured. Um, I have two young children in the Brookline Public Schools, a fourth grader and a kindergartner. Um, and I uh, am very concerned about uh, education. I'm a very strong supporter of the schools, which you heard earlier about Pierce. I'm also a strong uh, supporter of maintaining classrooms and teachers and small class sizes. I've advocated for that at, uh, at public comment at the school committee. I have to tell you, um, I found it offensive, a public smear and a lie for a uh, email to go broadly to town officials that says the town administrator proposed cuts to the public schools of Brookline. It's false, it's untrue, it's unfair, it's utterly disrespectful of the hard work of that guy right there who's been incredibly collaborative with this group, with the public schools, um, and many, many people within town. So um, I have actually reached out to a number of folks that have connections to the Brookline Educators Union, and I've asked them to signal that they should walk this back. It's wrong, it's divisive, it's uncalled for, and I wish it would stop. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, move on to our... I just Did you have something? Say, to say? Yeah, I just want to say <laughs> ditto. Ditto. Okay. Um, <laughs> yep. Okay. Well said. Next, our miscellaneous agenda um, items 3A and 3B. And then we jump over to item 3H through 3O. Um, I haven't had any uh, requests from select board members to pull out any other than 3C through 3G which are the uh, items that were voted by the building commission at a meeting uh, that there is some question as to the, the legality of. Um, so we're pulling that out. We'll deal, deal with them at a future meeting. Um, any questions about those items? Uh, John. Yeah. Um, could, could we have just, you know, uh, some simple basic explanation of what, what the question is about the, the legality of, uh, the there was a concern raised about the open meeting law about the whether the agenda was specifically detailed enough and out of an abundance of caution we want to just say to folks okay we will take we will run this back we'll make sure the agenda is clear and we'll revote to be very specific town meeting member Jocelyn Murphy uh, in real time uh, to the chair of the building commission uh, made a uh, request that the agenda was in violation it wasn't properly worded uh, for the for uh, votes. And so out of an abundance of caution, I, I watched the, uh, the commission meeting. Uh, the chair decided that um, they wouldn't take a vote on uh, the Pierce project uh, because 
because of the, the the question and all the other agenda items were worded the same. So I think uh, Administrator Kerry's uh, recommendation to hold these makes a lot of sense, John. Well, and, and I've, I've asked uh, for some clarification on it <clears throat> for a, a simple reason. Um, uh, I, I don't even have that agenda in front of me, um, so I, I won't say definitively that this is the case. But I do think we better be careful <laughs> about, we, ha we have to be scrupulous, we have to be correct about what is a, a, a proper agenda for a meeting and what is not a proper agenda for a meeting. But uh, my best guess is that if, um, if it turns out that we determined that this was not prop pro a proper agenda for a meeting, I think we're going to find there's a heck of a lot of meetings that had agendas that were similarly sparse, you know, in terms of what they said, you know, would be discussed and, and would be done at the meeting. And so <laughs> we better consider the implications of uh, drawing too strict a line on what is a proper agenda for a meeting. That's a point well taken. And we are we are looking at that. Again, this is not a guaranteed thing. It's not, we're not saying, oh, yes, this is this must have violated the open meeting law. What we're saying is particularly is out of an abundance of caution here. Um, you know, the Building Commission is very scrupulous in what they do. They're nonpartisan. They're they really pride themselves on being an apolitical body in an often a highly charged environment. And they want to do things right so that there isn't, especially, especially if there's a question on a project that has a lot of public attention. The last thing they want to do is, you know, move something along and then accidentally wind up delaying the project. You know, if there's some question. I, I agree, but not to put too fine a point on it. Yes. If we say this was not a proper agenda for the meeting, there were a lot of previous meetings at which there were also votes on on this project and a lot of other stuff. So right. we're, we're, we're on, you know, in, we're on important ground here, but we have to tread it very carefully. Yes. And again, we're not saying, we're not saying, oh, this is invalid and therefore everything else. We're not, we're not, we're not making that determination. All we're doing is someone raised the issue. There's the possibility that there could be a complaint that could gum up the process. Better to let, better to, better to say, okay, I don't know, but abundance of caution. Issue's been raised. We're going to resolve it. And we're going to, we're going to handle it this way so that there is no room for doubt. Yes. Yeah, and, I, and, the, and the other thing is, uh, th this is basically a message to all boards and commissions to be very careful that they, in their notice, make sure that they are sufficiently uh, detailed so that people know precisely what is on the agenda and, and what, what the vote will be. Um, and, you know, that's something that people should have always been doing. But Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I do want to add, John, that, you know, when, when a former leading opponent of the Pierce School Project files a complaint about an agenda item as not being properly worded, which is fine and well and good. I think it's important to be accurate. Just know that that request also goes across all agenda items for that agenda, any other equally worded agenda item, which is what caused the situation. Yeah, and if you look at the agenda, uh, all <laughs> were very um, vague and um, just did not tell us what, what, what was being voted. So anyway, that's, you know, that, that's why we're pulling that. Well, it might be time for some training on agendas. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a list of a couple of things we're working on with boards and conditions. <laughs> got a lot of agendas. <laughs> okay, I'll say. I think you should. I'm sorry, we're chatting on the side, and we shouldn't be. Um, so I, why don't you share with well, us? I, 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 <laughs> right. I, I think um, uh, that four of the five of us uh, were strong supporters of Pierce, uh, myself included, and. Um, I think uh, I, I would endorse being cautious uh, to preclude any possible future uh, attempt to uh, uh, put uh, put a stick in the spokes uh, when this thing gets going. Okay, uh, we I had um, I had made, made a motion, so I'll make a motion. I move uh, items three A and three B and three H through three O. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. John Van Skoyak. Aye. Uh, Miriam Ashkenazi. Aye. Michael Sandman. Aye. Paul Warren. Aye. And chair votes aye. And again, we will take up uh, items 3, 3, 3 C to 3 G at a future meeting, probably next meeting. Um, <clears throat> next calendar item, uh, sale of bonds. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Heinemann, come and tell us about the money that we're borrowing. How many? Pieces of paper did we sign? <laughs> did you all and sign the them already? That our AAA rate. No, <laughs> no, we have not. 
So good evening. Thank you. Uh, so Lincoln Heidemann, I'm the uh, director of finance for the town. Um, as uh, so I'm coming before the board now, as the board knows, to uh, seek your approval of the issuance of bonds for uh, <clears throat> for six different projects in the amount of $24.5 million. Um, it, true interest cost is 3.39%. Uh, it, the specific projects, uh, the largest is the Pierce School Construction. Uh, after that, um, the first borrowing for the fire station renovations and construction, the, fee, the Pierce School Feasibility Study, improvements to both Murphy and Robinson Playground, and um, borrowing that the town has done for several years now for stormwater improvements. Um, as, um, as was mentioned earlier in the meeting and as the board has heard earlier, when I was last before you at, at the uh, at the budget review meeting for the finance department, um, the town's AAA rating from Moody's was reaffirmed with this sale. Um, I, I did want to, in addition to you know going over some of the specifics of this borrowing, I did want to mention a couple things and get back on a couple questions and build a little bit on what um, town administrator Kerry had uh, referenced earlier in the meeting with respect to our AAA bond rating. Um, and respond a little bit to Chair Green and, and select board member Sammons, uh, some of the questions about what Moody's new metrics are. So uh, in brief, um, the uh, if if the board recalls um, at our rating uh, meeting or rating review with Moody's prior to this sale, um, they, there were some there are some new metrics that Moody's is now applying to us for the first time. And um, in since um, that discussion at the last board meeting, where um, the the uh, where the, the the borrowing and the ratings were discussed, um, Deputy Town Administrator Goff and I met uh, again with Moody's, did some more some further research to make sure we have a complete handle on what these change metrics are. There's five primary categories for how Moody's determines the credit worthiness of all municipalities. Um, throughout throughout the country and, and specifically in this case for Brookline. Um, one of the one of the primary questions that, I, that select board member Salmon had raised earlier um, that we have a definitive answer to now is the question about reserves and what percentage of uh, of um, of reserves uh, Moody's is now recommending looking for as as a as a percent of total revenue. And uh, if, as the board knows, uh, the there's currently a board adopted policy for a target of 12.5 percent of general fund revenue of general fund reserves as a percent of revenue, with a minimum each year of 10 percent. What Moody's is, in fact, um, to to confirm what we what had earlier said, what Moody's is now measuring is total revenue, so business type activities as well. So in our case, water, sewer, and golf, not just general fund revenue. And um, they're doing that um, because nation we've we've since learned um, in our further conversation with Moody's. They're doing that because um, th they are viewing many municipalities throughout the country having significant business type activities that are contributing in a significant way to you know the overall fiscal health of municipalities. So for example, airports. So an airport um, is a business type activity. Obviously, we don't have one, but many other municipalities elsewhere in the country that that uh, Moody's is evaluating does. So that that is their reasoning for why they have changed this metric. Um, and um, so, uh, what um, after this research, after these, after this further meeting with Moody's, um, as I mentioned uh, at our last meeting, uh, the budget review where we're um, in part discussing this issue is uh, uh, Melissa and I will be intending to come back to the board with specific um, recommended adjustments to the town's fiscal policies to continue to meet um, the, the, the Moody's levels. And, and I think that's likely to take the form not of changing the metrics. That is to say, I think uh, it likely would be um, recommending that the appropriate metric continues to be um, re reserves as a percent of general fund revenue, not overall revenue, but but rather a change in quantity, so that th so that you know through that change in quantity and through that recommended um, that policy change, that we would be meeting you know con and continuing to meet the the Moody's uh, metric 
by having by by um, seeking our own metric that makes more sense for the Brookline situation. Can, can I but, ask you a question? Uh, sure. So yeah. So I but but that's briefly that's that's uh, you know pre premature at that point. But at this point, but I just wanted to build on the conversation earlier and right. and say that we're thinking about this and, and we'll be coming back. So uh, two things. Uh, uh, one is you know the general revenues are about seventy five percent of the total of uh, of total revenue, something on it. I'm you know give or take. So uh, in effect, they're bumping up the reserve requirement by like a third. Uh, uh, if, uh, uh, that that's a big change, uh, and then where does the twenty percent come from? Because that was in their report. Yeah, so 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 to be clear, yeah. we we are meeting and and are continuing to meet, and, and actually are. So they they are listing that they were looking at our fiscal year twenty twenty two audit. Yeah, and they were saying, based on this metric that they have twenty three per twenty three point one percent. Uh, completely correct yeah. of our total revenue across all, all both business type and general fund activities um so 20 we have 23.1 percent reserves of our total revenue so we are meeting that metric yeah. um the as as Chaz mentioned earlier um other AAA rated uh, municipalities in Massachusetts have a have higher um uh, uh reserves as a percent of total revenue so um we're meeting that metric we're continuing to meet that metric we're actually doing better we know in fiscal 23 um but nevertheless you know we are below uh what, what that other median is in massachusetts and when they're looking at reserves do they since they're looking at total reserves do they also look at reserves from say the um uh, the the water and sewer revolving fund they are Right. Okay. So, so they're looking at, so in that case, retained earnings. So, yeah. so they're, um, right. So, so there's, so they're including those both in the reserves and in the revenue. Right. All right. So it's not quite, they're not, it's not like we have to bump reserves by a third. We, uh, it, uh right. It, it's not quite that bad. All right. It's yeah. So, so they are bumping it. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the, 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 the it's changing qualitatively and quantitatively. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, but yeah. So they're also comparing us to Massachusetts municipalities that uh, have a median reserve of what, 36%? 38%. 38%. And national municipalities with reserves at the median of what, 60% or something? Uh, like that. 60 some odd percent. Right. Yeah. So uh, the question I have is what is a municipality? I mean, municipalities don't always have to be cities and towns. So what's in their list of municipalities that they're comparing us to? So, so these are all municipal entities. So most, so in there are cities count, and towns. So cities and towns, but also counties, right? Or or independent water districts, for example. You know, which which is a common thing occasionally here in Massachusetts, but common elsewhere elsewhere in the country. And to be clear, just to be super clear, that that median, um, that that uh, thirty eight percent, that metric, that are. Um, that our other that that is the metric um, that that our our other uh, is the median of other AAA Massachusetts municipalities. So not all Moody's uh, Massachusetts rated municipalities, but just the AAAs. So, yeah. Um, okay, go ahead. Many of these municipalities don't have the type of restrictions that that cities and towns in Massachusetts have. So. And, and and that's a factor. So that it, you know, not to get too deep into the weeds, but when when you mentioned the 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 other the AAA municipalities that are rated by Moody's throughout the country, um, at with those higher reserve ratios, um, they note that, and they you know they um, there is some adjustment for that. In that, for example, we have Proposition two and a half here, and we have collective bargaining. Um, laws that that um, restrict things in in ways that. Other municipalities throughout the, the country don't have, and then conversely, the, the other municipalities have throughout the country have ability to pay to raise revenues in ways that Massachusetts municipalities can't. So, for example, through a sales tax, through other other mechanisms. So, you know, so they they recognize that and recognize that the Massachusetts AAA median can or will and should be lower. Hey, proceed. <laughs> so, and and I would just I would just uh, as uh, select board member Ashkenazi said, please uh, 
it, provided you uh, prove this, these bonds, please make sure you sign all the documents tonight so we can get them off to bond council tomorrow. <laughs> so, right. any other, John? Uh, you know, de dealing with um, bond issues is one, one of the most important things that a select board member does, but at the same time, you know, for those of us who are not experts in bond finance, um, you know, one of, the, one of the more mystifying. And um, in the interest of simplifying it for not necessarily this occasion, but future occasions, I'll tell you one thing that would be extremely helpful to me, and I think would be helpful to others as well, is if whenever we do um, an issuance um, based on, you know, the results of a recent bid, if we could see comparison communities that are also triple A and what they are paying for the same type of uh, extent, whether it's a 30, 20 or 10, you know, year, um, just to get an idea whether, you know, we're in the ballpark and you did yeah. that, you did that for me at, at my request and, and it was helpful. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and we can seek that. We, we don't always have information to um, the access to all the information, but we can certainly seek that. And our financial advisors handle many Mass Massachusetts municipalities. And we could certainly, um, for, for data that is publicly available, we could certainly have a, a comparison, say, for example, of sales above a certain amount within the last month, you know, that, that something like that. Yeah. And, sure. and the other thing I wanted to ask, if you don't mind, it, um, is simply how, how do we decide whether to go out 30 years or 20 or, or 10? So it depends. So in large part, it's, um, it's dictated by state law. So um, in, in Massachusetts, uh, the, um, the maximum, excuse me, the minimum term um, for which a school construction project that is receiving funds from the Massachusetts School Building Authority, uh, a grant from the MSBA, the, the minimum term, um, excuse me, the, the maximum term is 30 years. So in this case, um, we're at 25, um, but which, you know, I think is reasonable un under the circumstances. Um, but, but largely it is determined by the state law and then further rulings from the State Department of Revenue. Thanks. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so. I need you to take the vote, please. Pardon me? <laughs> you take the vote, please. Yes, no, <laughs> when, you, yeah, when you're ready. I'm getting there. When you're ready, sorry. <laughs> to clear my throat. You got a lot <laughs> riding on this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> do we have the votes? Yeah, you got to. Yeah, what's in the package? And and you there's no there's no um, need to read out the whole vote. You you could simply um, if you chose say approve to to say uh, you know move move the vote as printed in the packet. So I move the uh, uh, question of authorizing twenty four million four hundred ninety five thousand general obligation bonds of the town awarded to Robert W. Baird and Company, um, uh, as uh, uh, set forth in our packet. Um, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. John Vinskoyak. Sorry. Aye. Miriam Ashkenazi. Aye. Mike Salmon. Aye. Paul Warren. Aye. Chair Aye. Thank, Thank you, Lincoln. Thank you. <clears throat> you want to show the public what the documentation looks like? <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, yeah, this is one of the documents. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think the was it, like six that. point type, <laughs> I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next, uh, comprehensive plan contract. Um, Kara Bruton is going to present that to us. Season of license renewal. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Right. Let's, let's take that out of order. That's easy. It's easier okay. to do. It's easy to do. It's, we should do comp plan first. <laughs> You're here. Yeah. You're here. I apologize, my. No, it's okay. Bye. We'll. So, uh, good evening. My name is Kara Bruton. I'm the director of planning the town of Brookline. Also, Dave Genacakis is with us, I think, um, virtually, if someone might let him in, um, our chief procurement officer. He has worked with me very diligently on the um, RFP um, as well, which you all saw last fall, as well as the contract. Um, and we also, I just want to give thanks to the town council's office. Um, to So I'm here tonight to ask you all to approve a contract with agency landscape and planning, um, to prepare a comprehensive plan. This has been a long time coming. Um, 
I am also here to request the select board appoint a member to a steering group for this work, which we can um, talk about in more detail later. Um, first of all, for the audience at home, what is a comprehensive plan? A comprehensive plan is a uh, leading policy document that guides the future physical design of a community. And in doing that, it should clarify the relationships between the physical development um, policies of the town and the social and economic goals of the town, because those are certainly related. Um, in the RFP that you all saw last fall, um, which was drafted by a committee, because that's the way Brookline does things, um, and that was chaired by Linda olson Pelkey, and I know she was here earlier tonight um, speaking as well on the comprehensive plan. The RFP includes language um, that refers to the American Planning Association's best practices for a modern comprehensive plan, meaning um, rather than having topics segregated by topic, like transportation and then a chapter on housing, recognizing that these things all interrelate. Um, and so just to um, raise that up again, that um, idea from the American Planning Association is um, called sustainable places. And so that work and that methodology is incorporated in the work that we want to do for the comprehensive plan in um, presenting material to the community that integrates um, different disciplines, different subjects, um, because the world is is all related in that way. The um, contract, the RFP went out last fall, and the selection committee worked, um, has been working since January. Um, we had three very, um, very good proposals that submitted um, their ideas. We had multiple interviews. Paul Warren was on the um, selection committee as well as uh, Dave Genacakis guiding us through. Um, also on the selection committee was uh, Carol Gladstone, David Lee, Susan Padziba, um, Mark Zarello, Susan and Mark were on the RFP writing committee as well, um, Commissioner Shute um, and Emily DeHoog in, in my office. Um, so we conducted multiple interviews, reviewed supplemental materials, asked them to have follow-up uh, materials for us. We conduct extensive reference checks and interviews. Um, and tonight, uh, Bree Henshold and Annie Streetman are, have joined me from agency. Um, they are the lead consultant of this group, but as you probably saw in their proposal, it includes a collaborative with several sub-consultants, including Grayscale Collaborative, Ennis Associates, McMahon Bowman for Transportation, RKG Associates, and Util Architects. Some of you probably recognize many of these names. Almost all of them have done work of some kind or other in Brookline. Um, they know the community well. Um, I think the exception to that might be Grayscale. We haven't worked with them yet in Brookline, um, but I know that Linda talked about, Linda Pelkey talked about them earlier tonight. And that's all I have. <laughs> so I'm okay. asking for um, a contract to be signed. The team is here if you have any burning questions. Um, but we're very excited to get this going. And what I would love to have is um, for you all to decide an appointee for the steering group from your board mm -hmm. so that um, I can work with them and the planning board chair in, in getting the, um, the call for civic action up and going. But we won't come back to the select board until after the May elections for, um, for deciding who should be on the steering group. Um, and I may be back in between to talk about a, um, an idea that we're developing with Brookline Interactive to be a um, kind of under a separate contract to provide some enhanced community engagement in also civic education um, as an adjunct of this process. So, so, I'm not sure I understand. We're not, you don't want us to select a select board member for the steering committee? I, I do. Oh. <laughs> Just that I'll come back in May with, you know, let's not talk about the steering group members until May. I'm looking for is a select board um, appointee so that I can work with them to further develop the okay, group. That's confusing, but I think I know. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> any any discussion, Miriam? Uh, Kara, can you introduce your team? Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Bree Hensold, and I'm a principal and co-founder of Agency. Um, I'll be the principal in charge for this project. Um, working day to day with Kara and her team, and as well as. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Annie Streetman. I'm an urban planner at Agency, and I will be the project manager and day-to-day -day contact for this work. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Easy question. Just <laughs> Paul. Yeah, so uh, briefly, I, I do uh, just want to make a few comments that this um, has been a long time coming. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, we uh, I think I was a co-sponsor of the article to uh, have town meeting approve for a comprehensive plan and then the budget adjustment to to get it going. Um, and I can just, uh, I can tell you that I know the the planning process study committee, which Linda Pelkey mentioned earlier, uh, did an incredible job in the development of the RFP. Uh, as uh, she had mentioned, I was uh, part of the selection committee and we had uh, three great presentations, three proposals, um, and there were three uh, amazing candidates um, and they actually did the best uh, uh, agency landscaping and planning did uh, an incredible job. Um, and we feel very confident that they're the right partner. Um, I think what Kara was saying about um, the, the appointment of a steering committee, there is a broader committee that needs to be developed because this is a, um, a community led process uh, for, for comprehensive planning. And that's what she's talking about. There's no way you could put that together in, in a few days. That's gonna take some time for criteria and selection. Um, but I will say that this, um, you know, there's a few moments in, in, in the municipality's history where you where there's work that can last a lifetime. Um, and this comprehensive planning process is one of those very, very important activities that will have an impact for uh, for generations to come. And it really is, uh, it's really critical work. So um, I'm hoping that we all support unanimously the, uh, the approval of the contract uh, and appointing agency, our partner. Let's see, any other questions or comments? If, if not, I move approval of the contract for professional services for the preparation of a comprehensive plan with agency landscapes plus planning LLC in the amount of $575,000. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. John Van Skoyak. Aye. Barry Mashkenazi. Aye. Uh, Mike Sandman. Aye. Paul Warren. Aye. And Chair votes aye. Next. We don't have to wait till May. <laughs> Question of designating a select board member to the Comprehensive Plan Steering Group. And I think that uh, it's Paul Warren that, that uh, has, has uh, been identified for that purpose. Is that Recruited, hijacked. Uh, <laughs> I, have, I, have, I have been asked. Um, it would be my honor to uh, serve on it. Um, it certainly is gonna be a lot of work. Um, we will. I would like to have a discussion about some of the other things committees that I've been working with that maybe we could uh, get some help with. Um, okay. It's just to free up some time, but yeah, I, I would be delighted to do it. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to making a contribution. Yeah. Okay. Then I move uh, uh, the designation of uh, Paul Warren as the select board member to the comprehensive plan steering group. And apparently we'll do something else in May. <laughs> The actual group, the appointment of the actual group. Okay. Um, I need something to steer, Bernard. Okay. <laughs> A boat to steer. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. John Van Skoyak. Aye. Miriam Ashkenazi. Aye. Mike Sandman. Aye. Paul Warren. Aye. And Chair votes aye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <clears throat> Congratulations. <laughs> Hey, next we have our budget reviews. Sorry, you have one of the oh, I'm that, sorry. That pesky license. Oh, my eyesight is just okay. Um, and why are we doing this here instead of the uh, licensing? Good question. Um, and the answer is scheduling. And I really have done my best to uh, address that. Before we proceed, I just want to note um, we got a note that uh, if you're watching this uh, on cable access, uh, there is a sound problem originating at the big. Uh, level. There should still be captions. I understand Big is putting a caption on. Uh, there is still sound available on YouTube, Facebook, everywhere else. This is streaming. There's just a cable issue. You can turn on your closed captions and you should be able to see the captions even if you can't hear it. We apologize. We're working with Big to correct that. So uh, uh, how, how will people hear what you've just I said? I hope they can read lips um, <laughs> if they cannot. But I, you know, again, big, <laughs> hopefully big will be able to uh, put a message up. Uh, but I just wanted to put this out there in the event that savvy users may have already turned captions on. I have the uh, millennial practice of watching with captions, and I hope you do too. It's great. Um, 
Um, okay, seasonal license. Yes, okay, schedule. Now, why isn't this a hearing? So there is not there is no need for a public hearing with a seasonal all alcohol oh. license. Um, the reason why Hemlock Grill has a seasonal license is because they are on town property. They are not allowed to have a year round all alcohol license. Um, and so what they typically do is that for their quieter seasons of operation, they apply for and receive uh, shorter term temporary licenses. And then in the um, when they go back to a full schedule, um, which begins very shortly, um, they have a seasonal license that they apply for with the board. Um, it was just a matter of timing this time around. Ordinarily, we would not grant an exception and put this on, but because it is a business on town property, we thought it would be appropriate in this limited instance. Yeah. Any questions about uh, this this item? Nope. I would yes, just Mary. say that I had dinner at the Hemlock Grill uh, for one of their fireside um, dinners on Saturday, and it's just a fabulous place. Um, and I just, it's just a great addition to places to eat uh, in town. So that's all. Thank you for that. Yeah, <laughs> I've not eaten. I mean, besides the meat there for oh, the the fireside dinners are just. Yeah. Just great, fun, okay. fabulous food. Hmm. Any other uh, questions or comments or whatever? No. Okay, I move approval of the um, seasonal all alcohol license for Game Hinge Golf LLC doing business as Hemlock Grill, 1281 West Roxbury Parkway. Uh, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. John Van Skoyak. Aye. Miriam Ashkenazi. Aye. Mike Sandman. Aye. Paul Warren. Aye. Chair votes aye. Now back on track, department budget reviews. Um, first of all, we have the Council on Aging, but I want to first say that you know what what we've asked uh, various departments to do uh, in their presentations is um, talk about uh, the measures for success that they use and uh, their goals for the fisc for this fiscal year um, and metrics they'll use to determine how those goals are met. Uh, without, we're also asking them to indicate any new initiatives that they'd like to pursue within their current budget and uh, any uh, plans to add or subtract personnel um, and some details regarding that. So I just wanted to let you know that you know we, we've given uh, departments uh, some guidance in terms of their presentation, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing first from the Council of Aging. Uh, Ruth Ann Dobeck, good evening. Thank you, Chair Green, Select Board, and members of the public. I am Ruth Ann Dobeck, the Director of the Brookline Council on Aging and Senior Center, and it is my honor to present the Council on Aging's budget for FY25. We are extremely proud of what the Council on Aging does. We feel that we are very cost-effective and provide a wide range of services that allow our older adults to remain in Brookline and live independently with dignity. And a theme of this evening will be talking about the future uh, and our budget concerns, not in FY25, but beyond. Uh, Charlie, do you have the Slides for slide two, please. They're up. Thank you. Um, the Council on Aging's FY25 budget is 1,200,000. We primarily are staff heavy. 87% of our funding goes for that staff that's doing direct service and providing all those essential programs and benefits to older adults. Our FY25 budget is very stable. Um, the only increases are for some contractual obligations for a copier lease, building cleaning, and wireless communications. Those all total a mere 1328 in additional request that was provided. Next slide, please. Our accomplishments in FY25 were really sought in our 24. This is a result of 
two items that were much discussed. One is our social workers, our mid-management received a, a look at through, a, it was a select board um, recommendation last year. And we saw with working with the finance, Melissa Goff, Charles Young and Chaz, that our social work mid-management was undercompensated. And this was looked at in, um, with HR, job descriptions were modified and reclassified. So our mid-management goal of achieving parity with some of the other communities for our social workers was achieved. The next really big accomplishment came as a result of the override. We were able to see in FY24 this year, $25,000, which is going towards our social work position. Uh, it is now uh, something that had been 20 hours is now fully funded by the municipal budget. And this in 25 will increase another 50,000, which will maintain that social work position and start to add the transportation coordinator as part of the municipal budget. Our TRIPS coordinator who provides all the transportation services coordination has been funded only by grants and foundation since its inception back eight years ago. So this was a major achievement. Next slide, please. The Council on Aging received three earmarks this year and this tells a major story about our success in being able to provide not only cost effective services, but able to garner community support for some of our needs. If you recall, three of the earmarks are for strategic planning, uh, transportation, and for a creative arts, I'm sorry, for employment was the second earmark. The governor in January instituted a 9C cut and those earmarks were reduced by 50%. Instead of throwing us into a series of what are we going to do, we had two community responses for the senior employment, which was cut by 25,000, a single benefactor made a donation to our foundation in that amount in order to keep senior employment on the forefront and be fully serviced. The strategic plan is able to move forward despite being cut by 50% because we're able to work with UMass Gerontology Institute and receive a municipal benefit of a contract which is under the 50,000 range. The final grant, which looks small at 2,500, another family foundation has stepped forward. Creative Arts has been one of the most successful programs in breaking social isolation and loneliness for our older adults. And a family foundation has stepped forward to increase that funding for creative arts for the next couple of years in the amount of $30,000 to our foundation. I tell this narrative because so much of our funding is outside of the municipal sources and we need to be planning in the future and dealing with these issues. Next slide, please. Our outside services in this current fiscal year total over $690,000. This means that the municipal portion of our budget is just 64%. This does not even include our successful ARPA funds. So the concern is with that much funding coming from outside sources, we need a sustainable, plan and for the community to acknowledge that so much of what is happening at the Council on Aging 
is coming through these outside sources. Next slide, please. ARPA is another success story. We received from the town allocation $572,000 in ARPA funds. These are going to very important projects. Our transportation, which I keep talking about, the needs of transportation and access is now an equity issue. Food insecurity. We're already depleted the $100,000 allocated by ARPA soon this year and are applying for round three for food insecurity issues. The third has been around digital technology, which is ever important as seniors need to navigate online. And I call digital technology similar to literacy in today's world. A third funding source has been 80,000 for a new electric vehicle, all extremely important. So while we're extremely grateful for the ARPA funds, those three projects that I mentioned are not gonna be solved by the end of ARPA in 2026. We're still gonna to need to look at funding for transportation, food insecurity, and digital literacy and technology. Next slide, please. I wanna spend a brief moment on the census data because despite the fact that it's 2024, this was the first year that we really had solid statistics from the census that we can now say, yes, indeed, there are 13,222 older adults from the 2020 census. That's a 20% increase from the 2010. And if you calculate that those who are 55 and the next generation of older adults, it co constitutes 25% of the town's total population are now aging in place. The other statistic that I want to bring attention to is the increase in poverty. This is deeply disturbing because we know that the poverty level is so low as calculated by the federal government. The fact that it increased to 10% from seven is real concern. And again, underscore that that is just the poverty level, not those who are living in economic insecurity. Next slide, please. We were asked to present about how we calculate our metrics of um, measurements. And I'm going to talk about, again, digital technology and transportation this evening. Our digital technology is ever increasing importance for the town and our older adults. Through our volunteers, we are providing over 500 hours of one-on-one -on -one and group education services on digital technology. We also distributed 225 tablets through, again, ARPA funding to get tablets into the hands of low-income and disabled individuals. This has been a great success and needs to be an ongoing program for the Council on Aging in the community. The final statistic is 4,000 of rides were utilizing smartphones to call their lift. That's showing, again, the support of our educational programs in providing uh, seniors with access to digital technology and transportation. Next slide, please. Transportation again and again and again comes out to be a high priority in any needs assessment done in the community. It is an equity issue. It is access. It is being tied to health measures as well as social isolation and loneliness. We've seen an explosion of our transportation since we've been able to fund through ARPA. 
Uh, since COVID, the year after, our transportation rides increased by 78%. And I just provided some January stats. Uh, the total invoice was over $14,000 for subsidized rides. This includes 840 rides. We have 497 people signed up to receive transportation through the Council on Aging. We provided 407 rides to and throw the senior center, 257 different individuals in January took uh, advantage of those subsidized rides. So that just gives you a brief uh, showcase into the importance of transportation. Next slide, please. If we're looking at our five-year plan, I tied it into, and if money were not an object, mm -hmm. we are seeing three priorities. Again, the strategic plan will happen. It's got funding, it's moving forward, but the issue is what is it gonna find and how are we gonna fund some of those needs? The second issue I've been talking about this evening is again, how long are we gonna keep the transportation funding sustainable? As I mentioned, there were $690,000 through 10 sources of uh, funding. Mm -hmm. Many of those are grants that are keeping our transportation programs viable. And finally, the senior center is back to saying we're over capacity since COVID with that growth in the senior population that we see both happening in 2024 and the next five to 10 years, we do feel like there needs to be consideration of some satellite site, whether it's at the Newberry College, someplace in South Brookline, or other needs for us to consider our growing senior population. Next slide, please like to conclude by also doing a shout out that this year we were accepted into the AARP age friendly network of cities and towns. As a reminder, the Brookline Council on Aging was the first uh, in Brookline. We submitted an application for the World Health Organization. We were the first New England town to be designated as age friendly. And this year we took it to the, be part of the AARP network, which is providing us with many best practices and information on senior service delivery throughout the country. Always say that we would not be where we are without our dedicated staff, our team of volunteers, which is well over 250 individuals, who are donating much time and energy, the Council on Aging Board. And finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention this evening that I have been publicly announcing that I intend to retire sometime in this calendar year. I don't want the budget discussion to be focused on my tenure. There's enough time for that kind of discussion but it's definitely something that needs mentioning as we're talking about the future and transition. So with that, I welcome questions, comments, and anything else from the board. Thank you. Uh, it's gonna be hard to replace you. <laughs> and that's gonna be part of this discussion, at least in the background. At any rate, um, any questions, Miriam? Um, Ruth Ann, first of all, thank you for a very clear and um, focused presentation. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, generally, I always ask at the end about ARPA funding, but you had a wonderful slide and you really talked about the impact of that, and I appreciate that. I want to say that the ARPA proposals we reviewed from your department were excellent and very clear on what they wanted to, to achieve, and it's wonderful to see that that has happened. So thank you very much. And we will, in fact, miss you greatly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. ARPA has been a tremendous 
support. Of course, I, I would be, again, remiss if I didn't mention that older adults have really taken the brunt of COVID. They're still reeling. You know, the statistics show that it is not just the time of COVID, but the aftermath with all kinds of implications around social isolation and loneliness and long COVID as well. And I think the fear that- And the fear, yes. Yeah. And we thank you for all your hard work on the ARPA and- Thank you. Okay. I think John was next. Ruth, thank you so much for the presentation tonight and for um, your many years of service to the town of Brookline. Uh, sort of a personal note, um, one of the first committees I got appointed to when I got elected to the select board in 2020 was to, there's two of them actually, uh, they must have thought just, you know, that I, I'm the right kind of a guy for committees that have to do with the senior population. But uh, I got appointed to the Age Friendly Cities Committee, um, and I got appointed to the Council on Aging, uh, to to be the select board's liaison to the Council on Aging and the liaison to the Age Friendly Cities Committee. Um, and uh, especially the Council on Aging, um, if, this, if this were a meeting of the Council on Aging right now, there'd be 30 or so people in, in the audience. Um, the, nobody does meetings quite like the Council on Aging does, and it's largely through the preparation of uh, Ruth Ann and her staff. And to see the teamwork between Ruth Ann and her staff and the, and the members of the Council at every single one of those meetings um, is just fantastic. They were one of the first to figure out how to do hybrid meetings. And so all of the meetings take place um, in the room at the senior center, but then also over Zoom. They have a very lively audience on Zoom, a very lively audience in the room. Um, they spice up their meetings every now and then like they will in April with uh, entertainment uh, and, and a volunteer appreciation day and so on. So anyway, all good things. Uh, uh, I, and now I'm gonna narrow it down to one very, very um, small thing. Um, which um, I just think is emblematic of um, uh, how, how maybe we need to do a little bit better job on behalf of the Council on Aging with the, the money that we budget. And I'm not going to I'm not going to blame anybody for this. Maybe I should blame myself. Um, but we haven't yet come through with money to um, spruce up the uh, senior center, which has been without, you know, um, serious uh, uh, cosmetic improvements um, for the 20 years or so, Ruthann, I think, is, is probably correct um, since, since it was, um, you know, since they cut the ribbon on it. Um, and um, it's a building that could, could definitely benefit from some paint and some polish and, and so on. And uh, so I, I do hope we get that um, done one way or the other this year. I don't have the magic answer as to um, doing it, but um, I, I hope we sort of get all, muster all of the forces and the dollars together to do it. Because uh, it's time to to uh, the the year of, of of you know celebrating Ruth Ann's achievements on the board uh, in the on the council or as the head of the department uh, would be a perfect year to see that um, happen at the senior center. Oh yeah, I sure I want to follow up on that because it's a, it's a it's a point well taken. Um, I will say one of the big ARPA projects and one of the ARPA projects that's going to likely come in for reallocation before you is the renovation project at the senior center that will address what I know some members of the community have raised with regards to the HVAC system will also be electrifying the building that will require some work in the interior as well as the exterior. We will take that opportunity hopefully to do some of that interior work as part of that effort with regards to exterior matters. We will obviously take a look and we can have that discussion with the building department when it comes time to discuss their budget and the CIP for repair and maintenance, just talking about for the town town owned buildings, you know, between the town and the schools, I think there's some, you know, 80 to 90 buildings that we own and what the maintenance schedule is there and when the uh, senior center building is up next uh, for that, those efforts. So we will make sure we will, you know, stay tuned and watch this space, but in terms of some of the issues in the building that, Ruthann has identified and other members of the community have identified, we are already using ARPA funds towards that purpose. It's very good news. Thanks. Oh, yep. Uh, Ruthann, uh, I too want to say thank you for your service uh, to our community. Um, you talked about the the future and you have concerns about, you know, the budget and stuff like that. Um, I have great concerns that we're losing you 
because you have been a tremendous force of nature uh, for our senior population and the work that you've been doing to pull funding. Uh, the, the, what you've been able to accomplish with such a small amount of money is absolutely incredible. Um, and I want to thank you for that. And I think that's one of the greatest risks that we have in the future is that um, I don't know how we're going to find someone mm -hmm. with your uh, with your skill set. Um, but you did say something. Um, Ruth Ann actually came to the community block grant, uh, grant money. Uh, I, I got to chair that. Um, and Ruth Ann, you brought a uh, transportation proposal. And this, uh, I, I want to make sure we focus on this. This is a significant issue. Uh, the, the transportation needs for seniors, uh, getting them to doctor's appointments, getting them to uh, to the council on aging. And, uh, you know, th this is a really critical aspect. Um, and, you know, Ruth Ann mentioned loneliness. Um, th it's it, it's a huge issue. And I'm I'm really concerned about how that program is currently funded. I mean, it really is pulled together from uh, some block grant money. Um, I think some ARPA money has been used. And I'm, I, I guess, could you speak a little bit to how much, what is the total dollar value of the program today that's funded? I know some comes from various, and, and when does that money disappear uh, from the one-time funds either, uh, you know, I think from ARPAs, maybe where the bulk of it's coming from. Well, and, and to put more bad news on it, one of our sources that we've been increasingly dependent on is uh, what they call the TNC funding. Uh, that is the money that comes back to each community. Um, each Uber and Lyft ride or ride share is taxed 10 cents. And then that comes back to communities. And uh, we advocated and worked very closely with the transportation staff and the transportation board um, to secure TNC funding for our transportation. Uh, this, this current year, town meeting voted 100,000, uh, but we just found out that that TNC funding is uh, likely to end um, unless, I, I, I don't know if there's any chance that the state will reenact it, but it also is going to expire right when ARPA ends in 2026. So uh, that has been a big source of our money. Uh, we do, as you know, every year apply for CDBG funding for transportation. Um, and we've been very fortunate to receive mass DOT funding um, for transportation. So uh, that is going to be one of, of the big issues facing the, the town. Mm. Uh, again, how do we um, deal with that very expensive Transportation is expensive, unfortunately. Right. And Ruthann, uh, you 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 came to the CDBG committee with an ask for, and we weren't able to give you the full amount. Right. Could you tell us what is what is the gap uh, between what you need in order to fulfill uh, the current program uh, with seniors that, that you had planned, uh, and, and and what the money that you have actually been able to cobble together? Is there a gap? There's not a gap because again, we have secured great deal of ARPA funding. Okay. And the, the biggest ask of that ARPA of the 567,000 that I mentioned that we received, uh, well over 300,000 was allocated for transportation. The bulk of it okay. went for transportation. So that's 300 from ARPA. And then you're saying, was there another 100 from TNC? TNC funds? and oh. then the CDBG. Okay, so that so we're, we're, and then we're also going to be getting some mass DOT. Right. So funding. so we're, we're secure through twenty twenty the December thirty first, twenty twenty six. Okay. So I'm trying to understand the cliff that you're heading to. So the cliff is three hundred thousand dollars from ARPA, a hundred thousand dollars from TNC, the forty five we gave you is from CDBG. I mean, you're heading you're heading towards a half a million. Potentially. Yeah. This is, I just I I just want to say that. Um, I, I really want to put an emphasis on this. This is a huge issue. Yeah. Um, se seniors are tremendously dependent upon this transportation program, um, and we're going to need to really focus on how to make up this uh, this gap in 26. We're looking at all available options. One of the things that's in a very nation stage is we've had conversations with our other communities, particularly Newton, our neighboring community. This is a high priority for us. We know how important this is for folks to get around, and we're going to do everything we can to 
to stave off this cliff. And and I want to say one other thing. I'm not sure that it's just an older adult issue. Oh no, yeah. And I I think um, what we've learned from COVID in, in transportation, it's an equity issue. It's a climate issue. And we feel too at the Council on Aging, we don't want to be the only ones fighting for transportation and access in this community. Um, if you look at Newton's program, you know, they were able to expand and look at taking care of transportation needs for some of their commuters to getting from the villages into the green line, students to after school programs. So, and again, what we heard through our hearings at COVID, the food pantry was having difficulty with transportation for their folks. Uh, the housing authority often cites that recreation. So it, it's a bigger issue. Maybe the comprehensive plan that we talked about this evening is another way of looking at transportation. Um, while I'm a strong advocate for the older adults, it's not just an aging issue. Yes, that's true. Thank you. So I just wanted to okay. mention that as well. Mike. Um, Thank you. Um, so um, I want to add uh, add my thanks and uh, and concern uh, for uh, 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 after you've uh, you know for for how we would ever find a replacement. One of the things that it's really interesting to listen to this is uh, the your ability to pull together multiple sources of funds, and whoever succeeds you certainly is going to have to um, do exactly the same sort of thing. Uh, can you? Can you give us a sort of an overall uh, an overall number for the total budget that you have between town funds um, that come out of the the operating budget and ARPA and grants that you've received and so forth? What's the the overall package look like? So in um, FY twenty four, um, if our municipal budget was at one million, whatever it right. is. You add six hundred and ninety thousand to that for outside sources. Okay, that was some of that is stable. One yeah. of that is our fortunately our formula grant, which is a state allocated um, per elder, and so that is a very stable funding of a uh, hundred and eighty five thousand per year for us. Um, but much of that other resources from that six hundred and ninety thousand. Um, is through grants and the senior center foundations. Okay, so it's that I recall the six hundred ninety thousand dollars up there, and I was wondering if that if, was the you that add represents that to the one point two. Yeah, that, add, that's our okay. total. All right, plus so. ARPA though, so it's even higher. Right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? Thank you for a very um, very well done and informative uh, presentation that. Uh, really focuses us on you know future needs of uh, council on aging thank you and again i did not want tonight to be uh, you know just talking about the transition i will be here for the foreseeable future and i just am publicly announcing it so there will be a smooth transition and we can all work together um, to deal with that so okay. ample time to talk more about that Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ruthin. Next, uh, fire department. I take it Chief Sullivan's on the... Uh, is joining us remotely, yes. On the Zoom. On the Zoom. Chief Sullivan, I think, got a haircut. Hmm. Good evening. Good evening, Chief Sullivan. I, I don't Those know new glasses how, too. I got new glasses. I don't know how I get the honor of uh, following uh, Ruth Ann almost every year, uh, but uh, it, it mm -hmm. truly is an honor, and uh, I'm going to miss her as well. She was the first department head that I went and visited when I got here to Brookline six years ago, and uh, she certainly will be missed. We all agree. I could share my screen and you have uh, that on your screen. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Now I just got to figure out how to make it full here. There we go. I think that does it. 
Okay. Uh, again, uh, John Sullivan, Fire Chief uh, and Emergency Management Director for the Town of Brookline, um, here to present the overview of the fiscal 25 budget for the fire department and the uh, emergency management function in the town of Brookline. So uh, 24 accomplishments, uh, just highlights of some of the accomplishments for uh, fire department and emergency management. Uh, we uh, have initiated the long-term uh, station renovations project uh, and uh, be happy to answer questions about that and continue to achieve the benchmarks for planning and design for that, uh, the first phase of that uh, long and uh, much needed project. Uh, number two, maintain maximum staffing levels. Uh, we've had long discussions in the past about the importance uh, on our overtime budget uh, at maintaining maximum staffing. Uh, and uh, we are in the process right now of having eight recruits in our drill school, along with the city of Cambridge, uh, who is running a joint drill school in our facility. And uh, they are anticipated to reach our fire trucks in uh, late May. And, and the third uh, is the initiation and acquisition of a second radio frequency, uh, fire radio frequency, which is uh, something that the town has needed for a very, very long time. And uh, as of uh, Monday, yesterday, um, the, the license has been approved by the FCC. And so I'm working with uh, Scott Wilder uh, and his staff uh, in um, coordinating what uh, other um, uh, pieces of the uh, of the puzzle that we need transmitters and receivers at our sites in order to um, establish that second radio frequency. See management. Um, we were successful in reestablishment of the uh, LEPC, the Local Emergency Planning Committee. Uh, our first full year of subcommittee meetings and LEPC activities uh, was uh, accomplished in this last year. Um, we've also um, taken on the task of development core strategic planning, including a FEMA approval of our hazardous mitigation plan, which is the foundational plan for all uh, our other plans. Uh, right now, uh, Cheryl Snyder, uh, our emergency management coordinator, is in the process of developing and um, um, reissuing our uh, SEMP plan, our uh, community emergency management plan, uh, which is uh, in need of uh, re re revising and uh, appropriating through MEMA. Uh, and then third, initiated a new community preparedness program until help arrives. Uh, Sophie Gordon, uh, who we have on a grant through URC, uh, and our our um, she she started our uh, our EP Buddies program uh, and continues to do that as well. Uh, initiated this through a UASI funding uh, until help arrives, and uh, we've delivered six programs uh, to over sixty citizens. Uh, I will just take a note that um, that very successful program that Ruth Ann was just started. Uh, through emergency management and handed off to the senior center, uh, we we had secured funding for two years uh, for that project during COVID, which was uh, an extremely helpful and uh, advantageous program, especially to our seniors. Um, and uh, when that source um, uh, went uh, by the wayside as far as funding went through UASI, uh, we were able to hand it off to Ruth Ann and her staff, and they've done a tremendous job of keeping it up and actually growing that program. So, um, Y25 goals for the fire department, uh, begin the first fire station renovations project, station four. Uh, we hope to uh, start that project in, in, uh, in earnest in, in the fall of uh, of 24 uh, and continue to reach our construction benchmarks as we go through that first phase uh, in that highly pivotal station uh, up on Reservoir and, and the Boylston Street. Um, second uh, goal is to operationalize our ASHER program, uh, which we completed uh, negotiations with the union in our last contract. Uh, we have had a recently had a tabletop exercise with the police department again through some UASI funding that we were able to secure and able to and, uh, um, have an interagency uh, tabletop exercise and 
the next phase of that is to go forward with uh, a hands-on uh, exercise. And we hope to be in the process of being able to do that towards um, the early stages of April uh, between the interagency operatives of the police department, fire department, and our EMS partners uh, at Coastal. And uh, the third uh, of our goals is to accept and deploy our new Engine 1 and Engine 4 um, construction acceptance, cust customization, and training on uh, those two pieces of apparatus. We have uh, our initial um, meeting with the manufacturer for their first phase, and uh, we expect to receive those uh, two new fire trucks sometime at the end of calendar year 2024. For emergency management, uh, again, to continue to uh, strategic review of all of our emergency response plans, including the SEMP, our OASIS plan for uh, migrant communities, um, evacuation plans, sheltering plans, and mass care. Those are all on the board for uh, this, this fiscal year um, coming up. Utilize regional asset management toolkit, which is a uh, function of um, uh, the greater Metropolitan Boston Homeland Security Initiative, and uh, to be able to track and um, maintain our resources uh, in a uh, more comprehensive fashion. Uh, but it also ties into the regional uh, assets so that if we were to uh, need equipment that we don't particularly have on hand, we would be easily able to go into that uh, tracking um, software and find our our neighbors who do have it and uh, ask for uh, assistance with whatever resources we would need. And then finally, to uh, continue uh, to conduct a full-scale emergency management drill uh, around uh, um, the state is, is looking for us to do a comprehensive uh, evacuation drill, uh, but we also hope to uh, accomplish a larger scale ASHA drill as I spoke about earlier. Long-term goals and objectives for the fire department. Uh, of course, uh, at the top of the list is our renovations and replacement of the fire stations. Uh, as always, uh, we continue emphasis on firefighter health and safety initiatives, including cancer screening, PFAS-free PPE, annual medical evaluations, and fitness standards for all of our firefighters. Also to increase our fire prevention footprint, including a true uh, community risk reduction program uh, and um, through the process of inspections, enforcement, risk analysis, and planning. And then uh, finally, uh, in the long-term plan uh, objectives is a ladder company in South Brookline. Long-term goals and objectives for the emergency management function, increased participation in our alert Brookline code red mass notification system, which has been uh, a very uh, robust and, and uh, well-received uh, and uh, again, uh, in our collaboration and cooperation with the Senior Center, uh, Ruth Ann and her staff have been able to sign up, uh, along with Sophie uh, Gordon and, and Cheryl Snyder, a, a great number of our senior citizens into this mass notification program, uh, which gives them, you know, a, a real sense of security and, uh, and uh, communication with the town in the event of an emergency and does for all, all citizens. And we encourage everybody to go. Uh, online on the uh, Brookline website, uh, EOC website, and there's a uh, QR code there and you can sign up for Alert Brookline and get those mass notification messages. Uh, strengthen the emergency response readiness for all Brookline responders, uh, assets through additional training and collaboration. And then uh, lastly, to enhance the influence of Brookline's objectives with um, the Metropolitan um, Metro Boston Homeland Security Region and secure additional UASI funding uh, from the same. Service level increases. Uh, the fire department has realized a steady growth in call volume from 2015 to 2023. Our total calls in that period are up by 25%, approaching 10,000 calls per year. Um, and our EMS and false alarm calls make up the bulk of, uh, the bulk of those increases. Um, the fire department has seen increases in fire prevention services, including plans review, site reviews, construction details, and enforcement. Personnel, uh, something that we've talked about in the past, and uh, we'll be looking for um, support from the, the town in FY23 
25 FEMA safer grant uh, for four incident command technicians. Um, they're, they're, they're imminently in, in, tied into the firefighter safety and accountability on the fire scene. Uh, it is something that uh, the, the town used to have many, many, many years ago. Uh, and through Proposition Two and a Half, budget cuts um, um, unfortunately lost uh, those uh, those command technicians. In today's day and age, they are even more vital than they were 20, 25 years ago. Uh, in order to assist on the fire ground with the with the, the one deputy chief that we have to make sure that uh, we are. At, at the forefront of safety and accountability for our firefighters. And uh, the SAFER grant is a way for us to um, utilize federal money uh, for funding for the first three years of employment for those four positions. Um, this, this is anticipated in our renovations project, and it is part of the uh, build out of station one in anticipation um, of, uh, of that change in, in our uh, manpower. Our priorities will continue to be the firefighter health, wellness, and fitness, uh, the fire station renovations, maintaining our ISO class one rating. We are currently in the process of um, uh, the ISO rating review uh, and will hopefully by the end of uh, calendar year 2024 uh, have completed that review so that we can maintain that class one rating, which uh, allows our citizens to have uh, access to uh, lower rates for their home uh, and, and commercial properties uh, for their uh, fire insurance uh, relationship building with local uh, 950 IAFF is always at the forefront of uh, most of my everyday, um, uh, you know, interactions. And we're, uh, I think we really have a, an excellent relationship and we continue to build on that in collaborative efforts, including our station renovations project, uh, which includes uh, members of the local on that steering committee. Succession planning, uh, as well as fire officer uh, professional development are also our priorities and uh, to enhance our community outreach initiatives. New initiatives down the line, something that we've talked about uh, between police and fire over the course of the last few years, uh, the inevitable replacement of the computer-aided dispatch uh, CAD system, uh, which is the foundation for dispatch for both police and fire. Um, the, the company uh, that we've been dealing with for the last uh, 20 years or so was bought up by uh, a Canadian uh, firm, uh, and it is uh, inevitable that the, uh, the, new, the new firm is going to uh, roll out their new product and uh, end of life, the one that we have, uh, it isn't a foregone conclusion that we will continue to go with that particular company, uh, but it is something that we need to uh, address and uh, it will be part of a CIP, um, I'm sure, uh, a, a CIP request between police and fire, public safety requests going forward. Uh, it is a multi-million dollar project. It is the basis for every uh, response that we do, both police and fire. Uh, and uh, it is uh, the foundational element of our dispatch system. Uh, continue to develop the town's emergency management function, including um, upgrades to our emergency operations center, and then uh, formalize our community risk reduction program, public education. And that is uh, my presentation for this evening. Uh, and uh, I know you have the budget book in front of you and uh, our goals and objectives as well as our um, our yearly uh, uh, performance indicators. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have regarding the fire department budget. Thank you, Chief Sullivan. Any question from the select board, Mike? I, I, I do have one, and maybe I should know the answer. This is a very answer, minor point. You mentioned UASI, what is UASI. <laughs> urban, Air, urban Area Securities Initiative. So okay. that is the federal program. Uh, you may have heard some pushback from our fiduciary uh, Boston uh, in, in the Boston City Council a couple of months ago uh, with regard to some of the, um, especially the, uh, the, the uh, Boston Regional Intelligence Center 
Um, ultimately, they they decided to accept the grant, uh, right. and uh, um, you know, which is good for all of us uh, in the in the UAC region. Um, it, it isn't as though the UAC funding would go away. We would just have to find a different fiduciary to um, manage manage the funds. Many of the UASI regions have a private entity that does it, uh, and they pay them out of the UASI funding uh, to do that work. Um, we have had the luxury of having Boston Emergency Management uh, do that work for uh, since its inception, uh, and they do a fantastic job, and uh, we'd hate to see that uh, that change anytime soon. Thank you. John. <clears throat> Chief, thank you for what you've presented tonight and for... Um all of your uh, services to Brookline and the department too. Um, I, I just want to focus in on one item out of the, um, the um, significant list of uh, fiscal year 24 accomplishments that you have presented to us. And you know, the item is number two, um, which mentions that um, quite, quite correctly, that in cooperation with the building commission, um, reviewed bids, negotiated a contract uh, to provide architectural design, project management, contractor bids, and related actions regarding the upcoming station renovation projects for stations mm -hmm. four and one. So that's, that's two stations um, out of five, and this is all in the context of um, uh, town meeting approval of funds and voter approval of um, Debt exclusion for five stations, um, yep. uh, many millions of dollars. I think it was 60 plus millions of dollars. Um, and now we're doing four and one. And you gave a very good um, and honest uh, report to the building commission at their latest meeting as to how the work on four and one is going and what the implications are for finishing all five stations within the allotted dollars. Can you sum that up for people tonight so that everybody is kind of on the same page with um, what could be a, a sizable ask that we're going to be facing in the future? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, John. So um, obviously when we uh, proposed the renovations project back in 2019, uh, pre-COVID, a lot of the planning uh, and the uh, estimates were done uh, under under that umbrella, if you will, that that place that we were all in prior to um, the the world shutting down for for a year and a half, um, the the estimates that were brought before the voters. So there's a difference between the Warren article and the allocation. So the Warren article, in and of itself, does not have a number affixed to it. It right. it simply states that you know the the town agrees to. Or the this this the citizens um, uh, agreed to the override, uh, not the override, but the debt exclusion to fix and renovate the fire stations. The allocation at town meeting uh, was based on the assumptions at the time of a sixty-five million dollar bond allocation to cover the costs at that time. What we have found as we have moved forward now, three plus years later. Uh, as the design team went into their uh, full analysis of the buildings, uh, as well as the cost of the fossil fuel free end of this um, and the and the associated cost to to do uh, whether it is um, one of several designs for fossil fuel free. Um, forgive me, I'm not a I'm not a, uh, you know, an architect who knows the 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 main uh, components of it, but there are three different choices and they escalate in uh, cost. And the last being, and the most expensive being the geothermal um, um, option. Um, so as you look at station one and station four and the total costs that they estimate now, based on the, the, the first choice, which uh, forgive me, I just don't have that in front of me right this minute to, to give you the name of the type of electrification system that it is, but it is the one that the architects in the building, um, uh, the building department uh, recommends be because of the, um, the, the nature of what it is we're trying to do with these older stations. Um, station four comes in about 18% over budget um, the, the estimated original budget, 
in station one comes in about 2% over the original estimated budget. Given the scale of the two different projects, station four being a much smaller building uh, and station one, obviously a larger structure, um, the cost implication for both of those is almost the same amount of money, even though the percentages are, are different. Um, but it does come in over budget. And so if you project that out over the course of the five stations, uh, by the time we get to station, the fifth station, um, if we do receive the, uh, uh, the um, go ahead to exceed the original expectations, but stay within the $65 million allocation, as we get to that fifth project, there will not be enough money in the allocation, most likely, to cover that last renovation. And we would have to come before the voters again uh, at a town meeting and say, this is what we have left from the original 65 million. Here's the cost estimate for this last station. Would you, would you vote to um, allocate additional resources under the original debt exclusion, which did not have a capped number to it. And I'm I don't, I'm sorry if I missed it, but um, did you give us a dollar figure as to what we might have to come back to town meeting to ask for? It's it's I didn't because it's it's really impossible to say at this point. Um, we're talking about probably by the time we get to station uh, seven. Um, six years from now, five to six years from now. So there's there's no telling what the cost implication of that is going to be at that time. The, the, the um, architects and the building department experts are confident that the, the first four projects will stay within the $65 million allocation that we already have uh, and approval for. It's just going to be uh, the... Uh, the nexus between what's left and what is uh, a, a, the actual cost for that fifth renovation. Now, one of the things that I had proposed forward, uh, even back when this project originated, was that our our last project, which is Station 7 at Washington Square, is one that you might recall uh, the union president at the time had advocated for a new station in the Washington Square area instead of a renovation. That is something that we we um, um, dedicated that we would look into. Um, obviously, trying to find property in order to be able to do that uh, is, is difficult in Brookline, any way, shape, or form you put it. Um, we are also looking towards the legislature uh, for the state, because there has been a pending legislation before the uh, House and Senate for the last uh, three uh, calendar years or fiscal years uh, in a similar a similar uh, um, uh, opportunity like the school department has. Uh, it's called the uh, Public Safety Building Authority. Uh, and so we're we are able to utilize money through the state to help fund building schools. Um, there is legislation for the same type of mechanism to allow cities and towns to ask the state for additional funding uh, for public safety building renovations and replacements. And um, you know, the hope is, if you will, that uh, by the time that we get to station seven, uh, that there will be funding opportunities in that arena as well. Oh, that's good to hear. Do you mind yeah. if I follow up with one sure. short? Yeah. Um, a quick question, and, and then I'll have just a quick summing up comment of my own. Um, so I just want to be sure the people who are listening to this understand, and you, you've stated it very clearly, but I just want to be sure people hear it clearly, because you said we'll, we'll do the first four within the allocation that we were granted by town meeting, which is the 65 million, which was actually for five stations. So, so when you're, you're correct in saying that, but the implication is, you know, some amount, you know, maybe, maybe the entire amount for the fifth station won't be there because we will have spent it on as part of the spending on the first four. What, what was the amount in the budget for the fifth station? 
um, it, it, it was in the area of six million dollars for the renovation. OK, OK. Um, and the, the sort of summary comment I wanted to make, because I, I think it's one of these distinctions about debt exemptions that people might not fully understand. When, when a or debt exclusion, excuse me, um, when a debt exclusion on the ballot has no dollar number on it, um, if the project ends up going over the total amount that was allocated by town meeting, town meeting can then come back and increase the amount of the budget for the project, and it will be treated as though the voters have already exempted the additional amount of debt. Uh, that, that's how you expressed it, as I understand, and I believe you're quite correct in that. Mm -hmm. That's the way I understand it as well, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, Paul. Uh, Chief, thank you for your your presentation and for um, providing some clarity on this issue. And John, thanks for thanks for bringing it up. Um, I guess, did we tell the voters we were going to build five, renovate five fire stations when we approved the... Uh... Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I think that's a big problem. Um uh, frankly, we should renovate five stations uh, for the 65 million. Chief, is it what is driving uh, the cost overrun? Is there anything in particular? Uh, it's it's construction costs, prevailing wage, and the electrification of the full electrification of the fire stations. So, moving, uh, do we know what extent of the electrification is is causing the overage, percentage wise? Um, I, I don't, Paul. I, okay. I I can't tell you the exact amount. Uh, it 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 isn't really presented to us that way from from the design team. Uh, as a total, uh, it, we're just given the total. I don't I don't really have a percentage okay. of how much that is. And it, and again, this is this is with the understanding that we are going to choose option one, which is the least expensive of the electrification. Uh, options. Yeah, and I and I thank you for that. I guess um, I just um, and, and this isn't going to have an implication for the budget this evening. But when we when we ask the voters for something, uh, we should deliver what we commit to the voters. So if we're getting if, if it was five stations, we should renovate five stations. I don't know how to work through that, but um, it, it it does seem to be a pretty significant issue. Um, but. I understand costs are escalating, but I, I guess I'm troubled by it, John. And thank you for bringing it up, John. I, I, I was not aware of that. Um, I learned something. I learned a lot of things tonight. Um, I, this, the, the second question, and I, I just, um, I hear a lot about this issue, and I never really understand where it's at. Um, it has to do with a ladder truck for South Brookline. I hear this <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, um, you know, Hancock Village is significant. It's grown quite a bit. Um, I've heard, you know, there's um, issues with potential uh, times. I'm not sure if, if, if that's 100% accurate, but I just, I wanted to hear from you, um, your thoughts on that. Uh, do you anticipate at some point that we would need to add a, a ladder company and truck to, to cover South Brookline? I think it's something that is is definitely on the table for the continued growth of the town of Brookline. Uh, as you saw in the program tonight, uh, we've had over the course of the last just eight years, a 25% increase in our call volume uh, with the same amount of resources. Uh, and that that call volume includes, uh, you know, all all phases of what we do. Um, there, there is a gap in response time for South Brookline for our ladder companies, just based on where we have them stationed at the moment, at this time and, uh, and, and, uh, station one down in the village, um, and, uh, also at station five on Babcock street, obviously North Brookline has the largest population density. Uh, and if you look at a job analysis of uh, firefighting uh, as a as a um, a breakdown in what it is that we need to put as far as resources on the fire ground in a certain amount of time to be able to affect effectual uh, an effective response to a fire. Um, the two ladders in the north end of the town are wholly appropriate, and we need those resources as well. Uh, in South Brookline, where the density of population gets uh, less lessened, uh, it it 
it, it is something that we have a gap in. Uh, and there used to be a ladder at Station 4 back decades ago. Um, that was changed um, after Proposition 2.5, and, and that ladder was lost. Uh, there was an experiment for a number of years with a quint, uh, which never really worked the way it was supposed to work in terms of closing that gap because it can't serve two things at the same time. Right. It has to be either an engine or a ladder. It can't be both. Uh, unless you staff it with enough folks to make it both. And then if you do that, you might as well have a ladder and an engine. And okay. so there was no real cost savings there. What there was, was a, a placation, if you will, of the, um, uh, at the time that, oh, look, we're going to give you a truck that can do both. But in reality, it, it never did. Okay. And so but the the population is increasing in South Brookline. It is something that I believe, and we have done a study through the uh, International Association of Firefighters that was brought before this board a couple of years ago, and we will certainly redo it before we come back to the voters and ask again, uh, and even a, you know, a more deeper dive into it before we would ever ask for uh, the money to do that. Okay, so, but I guess in summary, I'm hearing you say, yes, indeed, um, at some point we may need a ladder truck a company for to cover South Brookline. Is that what you're saying? Yes. And okay. During, and can I, that's okay. Course, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, just, uh, I just had one more quick question. I, and yeah. I don't want to dominate the time. I'm sorry. Um, can you help me just understand order of magnitude? How much does a ladder truck cost and how much, what does it take to, to staff it? So at this point in time, uh, the estimate is about a million dollars uh, a year for personnel costs for an additional 20 firefighters. Uh, again, we would be looking to utilize the safer grant uh, opportunity through the federal government to uh, get staffing um, uh, costs uh, covered by the federal government uh, if we were successful for the first three years. Uh, and then the allocation could be moved into the, the town budget over time. Uh, that's, and, and that would be something that um, would be uh, most desirable. Uh, a ladder in and of itself at this point, it costs about a million three, million four, depending on uh, the ladder that you're buying. And um, that has a 20 year life cycle. So if you do the math out over 20 years, you know, you've got a, a couple of few hundred thousand dollars a year. A couple of Chief, this was real. This was really helpful. I, uh, you know, this, this has been kind of, uh, I've been hearing this for a little while and you, you clarified a lot of it for me. Thank you so much. Miriam. Yep. Hi, Chief. Hey, Mary. Um, I'm going to ask questions that I have been asking. So I know the fire department did get some ARPA funds. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? Uh, so the fire department received uh, sure. ARPA funds uh, for our diversity training um, in, in round one. Uh, we were not successful in round two. Uh, so we did a... Um, a fire department specific diversity uh, and inclusion training, DEI training for all of our members, uh, which was uh, widely um, uh, appreciated and accepted by our firefighters. Uh, I do plan to um, ask for uh, a round three, a, a second bite at the apple at that. It's been a couple of years now since, or a year and a half since we've done it. Uh, and uh, we've got 15 new firefighters and there's always more to learn. Uh, so that will be coming in round three as well. Um, and uh, we did receive uh, an allocation for uh, EOC upgrades. Uh, and so after the pandemic, we were able to uh, identify uh, some of the things that uh, were shortfalls of the, the EOC uh, during that time. And uh, one of the things is a secondary um, dispatch capabilities down at the emergency management center. And so uh, we are uh, in the process of continuing to outfit that second um, dispatch capability. Uh, and um, we did an upgrade to our call center uh, down there. And uh, we, we also uh, did upgrades to uh, the emergency operations center uh, layout uh, and platform down there. Great, thank you very much. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Um, 
Um, fire station down on Hammond Avenue uh, has a gas tank, I, I believe, right? Um, or, no. Which one? You, you mean like diesel and gasoline? Right. No. Where, where, where do you get your diesel and gasoline from? At the Municipal Service Center. Okay. okay. The, um, our, our station one at um, <clears throat> the village has a diesel um tank and and uh um capability but it, it doesn't it it doesn't have gasoline at all okay uh, my, my actual question is um how is how soon or is it possible for you to convert some or all of your equipment to electrical uh vehicles i know that there's a problem with some of them but or difficulty with some of them, but I'm just wondering what, uh, you know, what your plans are or what the potential is for uh, converting to electrical vehicles. So as far as our staff vehicles go, um, we, we, we look at uh, our options for our staff vehicles in the non-emergency response area. Uh, and so our fire prevention vehicles, our training vehicles, uh, and uh, we have, uh, uh, said in the past, and we will continue to commit that as we replace those vehicles and we have uh, charging stations available to be able to um, uh, to be able to reservice those overnight, uh, then we will certainly move in that direction. As far as the fire trucks themselves, the apparatus, uh, right now it is it is not cost effective for us to do that in terms of the um, we just don't have the infrastructure to support that. It is something that we looked at in the uh, renovations plan as to whether we would be able to add additional power to those stations. At this, at at that point, um, the it was not part of the scope of the renovations project, and it and so it is not part of that at this at this juncture. Uh, down the line, when we do Station 5 for a rebuild, we will certainly be looking to the architect to put those uh, types of um, uh, capabilities into the new fire station. But as far as the existing fire stations go, uh, we, we're, we're looking at a significant change to uh, not only the transformers that service each of these fire stations, uh, but potentially, according to National Grid, uh, having to look at the overall substation capabilities within the town of Brookline, uh, which is a, uh, according to uh, not National Grid, but NSTAR here, uh, if, if we were to be looking at the necessity to add or change the substations in town to be able to accommodate all of the electrification that's going on, you're looking at a 15-year lead time uh, in order to be able to do that. At this point, we are not on schedule within our vehicle replacement plan to replace new an apparatus until 2030, fiscal 2032. Mike. So uh, just to follow up on, I, I know one of the things that that is a barrier, because the chief and I have talked about this, is that um, when you have a uh, electric uh, a, a battery powered vehicle, if the battery runs out, you stop pumping, you stop, you know, nothing, nothing works. Uh, and I'm on the website of Pierce, which is one of the major manufacturers of fire engines, and what they offer is an electric vehicle, but it has an internal combustion engine engine for when the batteries have been depleted. So it's a hybrid. Yeah. It's and that's about as good as you're going to get, at least at this stage of technology. And and that cost right now, uh, Mike, is about double uh, yeah. what we're paying for right. uh, an engine right this moment. Uh, right. And it does not include the 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 sustained costs to our utilities to be able to continually charge all of these vehicles as well. Right. Yeah. I, I bet the car, the, just looking at the size of the battery and they're drawing, I would say <laughs> it's, <laughs> there's a lot of money just in the battery. Cause you know, that's, that's typical. Sure. Okay. 
Any other questions, Dane? Comments? I just want to note, yes. um, note that Melissa is on as well. And you talk a little bit about the fire station projects. Uh, Hello, Melissa. Hi, I just wanted to add um, something to the conversation about the process for, um, you know, when it, when a debt exclusion related process um, project goes over budget, um, how that works. We we had that experience a few years ago with the high school. Um, there is a, a, a form that we would need to fill out and um, discuss with the Department of Revenue to explain the overage. And, um, you know, it's something the architects of the project would need to kind of help us uh, sort out the explanation behind the overage and then the Department of Revenue would then make a determination as to whether or not any overage could be applied to the to the existing mm. authorization for the debt exclusion uh, or whether we would need another vote in order to get additional capacity. So, um, you know, a lot of that has to do with the way that the project is presented. And it's also something that I always remind the advisory committee um, that their project explanations that go in front of town meeting are critical because that's really what DOR relies on when they're looking at whether or not a project is still within the original scope that was contemplated at the time of the vote. Thank you. And just to add on this, because I know we, we've been working internally on this question of how over budget we are, what the options are, but we are in agreement that we want to do this and do it right. We want to balance the community priorities between electrification, getting to net zero, getting to car, car to not just net zero, but fossil fuel freedom, um, and figuring out how to do this project at the budget that we told the voters it was going to cost. So we're still working together internally to present a plan to the select board on next steps here, which is where we are. And I, uh, may I, Bernard? Sure. Uh, and Josh, that's great news to hear. Um, and Melissa, I, if I recall the high school, I think this was the high school project where we we had the overage. And um, in addition to how the project's defined, it, it, there's kind of a percentage threshold, right? That that once you get beyond um, is when you need to go back to the voters. Is that is that it? Is it as simple as that or is it more complicated? I think it's a little bit more complicated. So as an okay. example, with, with the high school project, we we had town meeting authorize a certain number. It was, I think, around $35 million. DOR actually said, nope, less than that is what you're able to apply to the debt exclusion. So we have some bonding authority that we're going to need to rescind because there's currently not a funding source. But it's not something that we were ever contemplating spending. Once we got the number from DOR, that was our revised budget that we operated with for that particular project. Okay. Great, thank you. And didn't we have to go, town meeting had to go back and vote for more funding for the yeah, I, Correct. I think, we, I think we did, yeah. Yes. But yeah. We didn't have to go to the voters. That's, no, I think. No, but town meeting had to re-vote. I mean, had to vote a second. No. Right. Oh, we, we did have to go to the Department of Revenue. And ask them. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm just happy to say that my overage won't be anywhere near the high school. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll yeah, we'll what they're that. trying to do essentially is, pro is you know, to avoid scope creep so let's say that you originally went for five renovations and then you decided you wanted to rebuild three stations instead of one um that is clearly outside of what was ever contemplated at the time of vote so that's what they're trying to avoid is is kind of growing the scope that was something that the voters right. never never knew about when they voted for it right. right i hope i hope they go the other way when you said that you're they were going to get five of something and now they're only getting four <laughs> so i think that's you know another issue that's probably important as well Okay, thank you, uh, Chief Sullivan. Next, uh, the library. Do we have someone to... Amanda is remote. I'm promoting her now. Hi there, can everyone hear me? Good evening, Ms. Hurst. Hi, uh, let me bring up my presentation. Okay, uh, are you all able to see my presentation? Yep. Wonderful. 
So I'm happy to meet with you all this evening uh, to share an update about the library department. But before we get started, I'd like to recognize that a number of our Board of Library trustees are also with us tonight. Thank you, Karen Livingston, Carol Lohe, Judith Vanderkay, Judy Goldman, John Margolis, Chris Chanisalkit, Kristen Hung, and Marissa Vogt for attending and support this evening. Uh, again, uh, this is a report to the select board from the library department. My name is Amanda Hurst, your director of libraries. So first I'd like to talk a little bit about our accomplishments in FY24. Uh, we are the fourth busiest library in the Commonwealth after Boston, Cambridge, and Newton. And uh, this number does not correlate to population size. As you know, Brookline's around the 18th largest town or city in Massachusetts. And so what I think that represents is that Brookline is a community of readers who appreciates its library. Also, our accomplishments include meeting our annual goals and completing four action items that the board votes on every year. And this is in addition to our regular complement of programs that we plan and execute throughout the year. Um, we've also implemented a number of process improvements at the library, which allows us to meet our annual goals and action items. And this includes improvements in scheduling and absence management, uh, employee onboarding, and our operations workflows, which um, has put structures in place to manage any unforeseen issues that we may have at the library um, in our day-to-day -day, uh, operations. The library is required to report a number of metrics to the state in order for us to remain certified. And so we do keep a wealth of statistics on our library operations programs and services. And I'll go into some of those in greater detail in this presentation. Looking ahead to FY25, before I launch into our key goals, I'll talk a little bit about our budget. The library's proposed budget is um, an increase of 1.8% from FY24. Uh, libraries, in order to remain certified by the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners, um, must meet certain requirements and that in, in order to remain certified every year. And that includes meeting its municipal appropriations requirement meet the minimum standards of free public library service, um, which is uh, open hours metrics, and, um, and then also submitting annual reports and forms to show that we're in compliance. The certification from the MBLC allows the Public Library of Brookline to receive its full award of state aid, which is approximately $100,000 among other benefits. And so uh, I work closely with town, the town finance in order to make sure that we're meeting that requirement with a budget increase. And in order to calculate this, we take the average of the previous three years budget and multiply it by two and a half percent and then commit to funding our library collections at 12 percent. So. The 1.8% budget increase that the library will be receiving will go to um, roughly 35,000 of that will go to salaries, 19,000 19, towards services, 19,000 towards supplies, primarily our book budget, and then another 7,000 to budgeted capital, which is primarily our leased equipment, computers, and um, copiers. Our key goals for this year are similar to last year's goals. Um, they're good goals and they've, they've served us well. And I think they will continue to serve us well through FY25. So that's to support K through 12 education and lifelong learning, focusing on two key areas, STEAM, which is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, the arts and math, as well as literacy. We'll partner with organizations in Brookline and beyond to increase the reach of library collections, programs, and services, especially to those who are unfamiliar with what the library is and does. 
Implement a library-wide strategy for equity and inclusion that will include deliberate practices to increase diversity both within the organization and in our collections, programs, and services. And then increase opportunities to, for citizens to engage with library staff, collections, and, pro, and services without having to visit a library. So our long-term objectives uh, with the library, I identified three areas. One is sustained growth of library program services and collections so that we'll continue to meet the um, changing needs of the community. Building improvements, which would include renovation or new construction in all three of our locations. And then advocate for internal pay equity among town staff. And when I talk about internal pay equity, what I'm referring to is that jobs across departments, um, or similar jobs across departments are compensated similarly. Uh, at the library, we have custodians, division heads and librarians like other departments, but they're all compensated very differently. In terms of new initiatives, um, we, would, we prioritize uh, initiatives that are service-driven and that prioritize the staff-patron interaction. And so we're carrying forward two that we hope to mm -hmm. see into fruition in FY25, which is the library bookmobile, which is partially funded by the ARPA round two grant, as well as an automated materials handling system and what this is, is a conveyance system of library materials that um, allows items to be self, allows items to be checked in and sorted onto a uh, shelving cart in order to go back on the shelf. So this reduces the amount of time that staff are actually handling library materials. And so that frees them up to um, interact uh, with our patrons. Uh, the AMH system will be installed first at Brookline Village and our estimated date of delivery for that is mid to end of July. And in terms of service demands uh, for library services, more is actually more. Any service increase in FY24 equaled an increase in our metrics. We uh, were open longer hours and we had extended summer hours and we had an increase in patron visits. So this past year we had 470,000 plus visitors to the library. We were able to offer more programs and we had higher attendance. And so we there were thousands of library programs with around 26,000 attendees. And then more access, we've been able to provide more access to our e-resources, which has um, increased usage. Uh, so year over year, we're seeing about a 20% increase in overdrive usage, which is our main ebook vendor. Uh, the library spends uh, its time reading to the town's children, we provide after school activities and we provide ELL and citizenship programs to new residents, as well as help our senior citizens with tech support and providing book clubs and other activities such as movie viewing programs uh, at the library for them. So really our constraints on growth right now are budget based rather than demand. When we talk about library personnel, the most, again, the most important asset of any library goes home at night and that's our library staff. We have 42 full-time positions and 34 part-time positions. Um, our part-time positions do not receive benefits and are capped at 18 hours a week. And part of my personnel wish list would be to be able to consolidate some of our part-time positions to either full-time or part-time with benefits positions. Uh, I also wish for an assistant director to public services. The library has a director for an assistant director for administration and typically libraries 
have both an assistant director for public services and administration. And then lastly, we can always use uh, additional IT support uh, in the day-to-day. -day. We hired a library IT support specialist and that position I think would be greatly supported by a help desk position as well. And then when I think in terms of no limits budget priorities for the library, it would allow us to do the following things, which is to hire and retain top talent, have state of the art facilities, be known for our innovative approaches to programs and services, cultivate a positive reputation with name and brand recognition, and have a recognition for our library leadership and expertise which would culminate in the Public Library of Brookline being a leader in our field. And so that's my presentation. I'm happy to Thank take any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you. Uh, Paul. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have one question and one ask. I'm going to make my ask first. Um, it would be great to have some sort of tag put on books because my children of forever borrowing books and I can never find them in the house. <laughs> I am constantly those, scurrying what, around trying to find the books. You, you want the Apple uh, tag? I, I don't care what it is, but if you, it's something that I can use to find uh, find the uh, the book would be tremendously helpful, the books. Uh, anyway, that's my own personal issue. Um, you mentioned that the uh, an increase in hours has increased the number of customers. Um, that's a direct correlation. Um, do you have a, a sense of the percentage hours increase and the percentage of, of number of customers? You you didn't show the change. You just said that we increased hours and we got 430 something thousand customers visits. Yes, I, I believe our visits went up by about two and a half percent over um, from the previous fiscal year. And then we didn't change our hours very much over the summer. Um, and so we were able to maintain summer hours with the exception of a Sunday closure at Brookline Village from mid-June to about Labor Day. And so we had uh, two locations then being fully open on Saturdays when the previous year they were closed. Um, we also increased Putterham's operational hours by about two hours over the course of the week as well. So I guess in to so in total the entire sy system wide, you increase the number of hours. In system wide, you had a two and a half percent increase in number of visitors. Yes. Okay, that, that's uh, that's great. So more hours equals more visits. I guess is what you're is what yes. you're saying. Is there a way to yeah. get more visits without increasing the hours? <laughs> Have, has that ever happened? <laughs> Well, you don't need I to answer we, that question. You don't need to answer that question. I will. No, I will say that we have been building back very successfully with COVID. Not every library has been able to bounce back the way our libraries mm -hmm. have in terms yeah. of usage um, since the COVID closures. Yep. Well, you're doing a fantastic job, and we love the library. And our family loves to visit, and you're doing a, a great work. Thank you. So th you. there's a uh, lot of uh, concern about uh, senior services in South Brookline, and uh, I was wondering if. Uh, the library in South Brookline um, has any outreach or specific programs in, in collaboration with the senior center for seniors? Or is we that do. something that you can look forward to? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we do. Um, we're actually a frequent partner in the Council on Aging. Um, our Putterham Library uh, has a program called Gentle Chair Yoga with Keith Beasley that's been happening for a number of years. And it's one of, um, it's a program that our South Brookline and senior residents are quite attached to, and uh, they they uh, support that program very vehemently. In addition to that, we um, partner with the Council on Aging on a senior book club that happens out of the Putterham Library that is available both, I believe is available both in person and online for seniors to access. So those are just two that come to mind. Right. Miriam. Thank you. I'm going to ask my usual question. So um, thank you for this presentation. Thank you for the work of the library. Um, uh, you had mentioned ARPA funding used for the bookmobile, 
but I think you got some other ARPA funding. So can you just. There was some ARPA funding in round one uh, related to some technology upgrades, and that includes um, enhancement to uh, our laptops. So we were able to replace some of the laptops. We also, during COVID times, where we were concerned about the number of people mingling in the library, we were also able to implement technology that allowed us to determine how dense populated a portion of the library was and uh, allowed us to space people out appropriately. Uh, we're still able to use that to detect uh, how busy our building is at any particular moment. And then the third that we have been able to implement what were solar chargers for devices at each of our locations so that people can sit outside and uh, recharge their devices, you know, with the rays of the sun as opposed to um, our electricity. Great, thank you. Yeah. Are those used a lot? Uh, well, they were installed in the fall, and so, uh, oh, so it hasn't been yet. perfect <laughs> outdoor weather to uh, test those out, but I suspect that they will get much we'll... usage, yeah, when the weather improves. Thank you. We have a small homeless population in, in Brookline, but, but uh, I understand that to some degree, uh, the library is a friendly and um, sometimes warm location. Uh, do you have outreach programs or how, how do you address you know, the issues and concerns that uh, arise with, with uh, homeless individuals in the library? You're, you're correct. We do make um, space for anyone that walks into our door. We do not ask for identification, for residency status, or for whether or not they, um, you know, or any socioeconomic um, indicators. And so the library is often seen as a place where people can go that is warm and dry when um, the weather isn't so friendly. Um, we treat our, all of our pat patrons similarly. If they can abide by our library rules of conduct, then they are welcome to stay. And um, when we notice that there are people who may be in need of service, we do have information um, for them. So for example, if a patron had a hygiene issue and they were in need of resources, uh, we have a brochure about the resources in town where people can get cleaned up, um, find uh, a change of clothes uh, and use of laundry. And uh, we, we also partner quite frequently with other town departments such as the town social worker to uh, work with folks who may also be in need of services. You know, um, we have a um, homelessness task force that meets uh, occasionally. Um, I, I assume that the library has a representative uh, to that in terms of coordinating yes. services across departments and um, around the town. Um, so, good. Yes. I just want to really thank you for that. I think it's really important to see our unhoused population as people and treat them as people with respect. So I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. John? Um, hi, hi, Amanda, and, and thank you for um, the excellent service that the library provides. A um, couple of questions. Have you um, had any particular issues with filling positions at various levels? That's one. And the other one uh, question is, Has have any individuals or groups approached the library with suggested lists of books not to be shelved <laughs> at the library? Great question. Uh, we have had a number of vacancies this year, uh, more so than I care to have, actually. Uh, but we have had successful recruitments for a number of our library positions. I will say that the industry in general is in transition post COVID. There are a number, there were a number of retirements um, during the pandemic. And then once the you know, organizations were sort of safe, somewhat safely through it. People, you know, felt like it was it was time for them to retire. 
And so the challenge that I have had in filling vacancies is mostly around positions that require uh, a high level or extensive level of experience. So when I talk about uh, those positions, it's for our department heads within the library, people who need to have, um, you know, five years of experience, some of that management experience. Um, and so those are the, the vacancies that have taken the longest to fill. Uh, in terms of um, any challenges or feedback that we receive on library materials, we have, we have not in my tenure had any formal challenges regarding any um, library book. Uh, and the, the library has a process for patrons if they did want to request that we reconsider um, having an item at the library that they would be welcome to follow. And ultimately it would be a decision um, by our board of trustees. But uh, a tenant of library services is what we call intellectual freedom. And so that means that we uh, carry books on a wide array of topics. And sometimes I'd like to say we, you know, there's always something in the library to offend someone, so. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, let me try one. A few years ago, there was a concern about uh, uh, requirements from the government, federal government, to uh, turn over information on the book reading habits of uh, patrons. Is that still a problem and, and how do we deal with it? So in Massachusetts, there's actually a law that protects um, patron privacy related to items checked out. And so there isn't a way to retrieve checkout data um, within the law that I'm aware of. And if we had a court order or FOIA request for that, the, uh, you, the library would act in consultation with town council to make sure that we are protecting patron privacy within um, Massachusetts law. Any other questions from the select board? No? Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Next, uh, warrant, uh, warrant articles, public hearing. We have two warrant articles up for public hearing, Article 9 to establish an accrued liabilities reserve. And who is going to talk about that? Is that Lincoln? Lincoln, Melissa, and I can, and Charlie, all of, all of us are here. Okay. <laughs> all the, the gang's all here. Good evening. Um, article 9 is an article filed by uh, both me and Lincoln um, to address our unfunded vacation and uh, comp, comp time liabilities. Um, we currently have a um, vacation liability of about $4.4 .4 million. Uh, now, obviously, um, that becomes a problem as we have uh, retirements, because uh, if you haven't used your vacation, um, that's a rather large buyout, especially as, you know, as you uh, accrue it and then you move on to higher level positions, that liability can grow. Um, you know, we've been looking at ways of managing our um, our employee balances for vacation and comp time. Um, we've made some strides in our mid managers and and technical staff uh, in terms of encouraging vacation use and um, you know trying to make sure that the caps uh, are adhered to. Um, it provides a larger challenge on the union side where you know a lot of past practice has allowed for the caps to go over, um, and some of the some of the employee accruals are rather large. Um, and as these employees are nearing retirement, they become more problematic. So um, we're looking to establish a reserve that would allow us to um, address some of the larger buyouts that may occur in the near term. Um, and so the Warren Article 9 allows us to establish the reserve. Uh, you, you may recall that one of the recommendations for the use of free cash is to provide a million dollars to support the establishment of this reserve. Okay, any questions from the uh, select board? Paul. Yep. Uh, thanks, Melissa. Um, so I just want to understand this a, a, a little bit better. So um, this is this is vacation accruals. People don't take their vacation and they get to carry it over. Um, 
is, is can you explain about how how do how do how does one accumulate vacation? Don't go. Vacation. I mean, that's essentially what it is. Is that you know we we have an annual allotment of vacation, and um, over the years, and this is going back decades, that you know people have not. Um, adhere to the caps that have been stated in both, you know, policy and some collective bargaining agreements. There, there are, it's not everywhere. I mean, I think that there are, um, you know, for example, uh, in the fire union, you have to schedule out your vacation every year. So the, the, the balances are not as large in fire, um, you know, in police, this has become a problem. We've had a lot of retirements recently in police, and this has kind of exacerbated the issue, um, needing to fund those buyouts um, that have occurred over the last, you know, three, four years. Um, and, you know, with our mid managers and our non union employees, um, we're able to, you know, better enforce some of the caps that we do have in place. Um, but it is still, it's still uh, a lagging issue just from years of um allowances that have been um given to to employees to exceed the caps so when you when you say what's the cap what is a cap tell me about the cap so i i, I rely on Anne since she is more familiar with uh the provisions of the contract and in, in kind of in general what the what the caps are um for the bargain i'm just wondering what the definition is is it you can you can only carry up to 25 hours or something or there's some unlimited caps. I, I just don't understand what cap means. So I can, I can speak to that. Thank you. Um, oh. Ann Braga for um, Brookline HR. Um, depending on the contract or the classification and pay plan, the standard is um, that folks who have been with us since 2013 or earlier um, have a maximum of eight weeks. And folks that came on board after 2013 is a maximum of six weeks to be carried over. That's the standard. Um, as Melissa said, um, in the case of fire and dispatch, um, they aren't allowed to carry their time over for the most part, unless there's a special exception made. Um, there are caps in other collective bargaining agreements um, that vary depending on, on the agreement and the number of hours worked. Um, but those haven't been um, enforced. So what we would need to do is to provide notice to the uh, collective bargaining unit e-boards to say, you know, effective such and such a date, we will be enforcing the caps. And much like we did with the mid-managers um, a couple of years ago, we gave them about six, six months notice to say we are going to enforce the caps. And what that means is that if you are in excess of the caps as of a certain date, um, you will no longer accrue vacation time over and above the cap. And we had, um, what will I say, a very vehement um, and strident response from members of the mid-managers who were um, not going to be accruing for them um, to you know that this was going in place. What I will say is with the exception, uh, we probably had about 40 mid-managers that were over the cap to any extent. And by the time we went to um, actually not um, allow for accruals, we were down to around a dozen and now we're probably under 10 uh, okay, for so, those folks so that are over and above. Thanks, so, so the caps do work. Bernard, if you could just bear with me, because I'm, I'm still trying to understand this a little bit. So, so when you say, let's take a six-week cap, that means mm -hmm. that an employee could carry over up to six weeks into the next calendar year. But do they carry it forever? Can they keep each year? Could they accumulate six weeks? So some people have 100 weeks of va <clears throat> vacation that we have to pay out? Or is our only exposure a max of six weeks for, uh, per employee? It would be either six or eight weeks, assuming the caps are being enforced. They don't. It isn't six weeks per year. Okay, it's not. It's not. It's out. not. It's not accumulating over over the lifetime. I guess I'm. I'm hoping that. Um, I understand with collective bargaining that with the unions we have to deal with that as a collective bargaining. But um, this seems like something that I'm hoping that we can get ahead of and enforce. It seems self inflicted. <laughs> Uh, a, a bit, but this is a big reason why in this fiscal year we want to establish this fund is because mm -hmm. to be clear to folks, you know, they're they're as part of negotiating. It's possible that what we might do is, for example, we might have a uh, in one one aspect of 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 uh, vacation time is compensatory time, which you know is very uh, 
there's a high amount of that in the police unions. There's a high yeah. amount of that elsewhere. And people, you know, it's a, it's a benefit. People would, you know, accumulate a fair amount of it comp time um, for taking certain shifts or doing certain work. Um, and so if we were to say as part of a bargaining process, I don't know, you know, if you're X, if you're above the cap to X amount as of six months, you know, there was a little be a one-time offer to buy back some of that money, buy back some right. of those hours. Right. Um, so I think, I think the fund is an acknowledgement that we have a growing liability and we need to try to put money away for it. Yes. But the real right. issue is we're not enforcing. Well, our cap. <laughs> was, the, that's the we're, problem. We're enforcing the cap everywhere we can. Um, <laughs> the issue that we're facing is that in areas where past practice is, has limited our ability, we're going to need to bargain it. Um, mm. And so part of bargaining is incentivizing new patterns of behavior. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I was going to say that the other part of bargaining is for management to do its job and enforce where it can. That's correct. And it sounds like you're on the track for that. Yeah. Good, good, um, right. So uh, we're, we're going to be. We need to fund this in the in subsequent budgets, presumably. Uh, uh, yes. A a, uh, a a a reserve fund without any money and it doesn't do much good. That's right. But again, we're fortunate. This we're fortunate this year. This year, we, it's it's a unique opportunity for us. We're talking about limiting liabilities across the board, limiting pension liabilities, yep. limiting OPEB liabilities, contributing to the stabilization fund, dealing with things like this. I will note that on this matter, it's not exclusively a town issue. There are some school caps involved. There are people who are at the caps in the schools, um, so it's not entirely a town side issue. And we want to make sure that that's reflected as well. One of the other things that we encounter is that um, sometimes we have folks transfer between the schools and the town. And when they come over from the schools where there are different policies, sometimes they come over with significant vacation balances. Um, and so that's an effort too we need to be able to control for. Um, you know, I, I don't want to name specific cases, but you know, some of some of the 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 some of the bigger cases have involved employees that have transferred between schools and town. And you mean the funding doesn't come along with them? Ah, if only. <laughs> okay. We'd have another 150 emails if that happened. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> okay, this is a public hearing. Uh, I'll open up the public hearing to see if anyone would like to speak. I see someone coming up from the uh, back of the auditorium. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Very yeah. well. Um, thank you, members of the select board, for your service to this town and for listening to my public comment tonight. Um, I am a longtime Brookline resident. My name is Liz Gorman. I'm also the parent of two Brookline, um, well, Lincoln School and Brookline High School students. Uh, I am also a Spanish teacher at Brookline High School in my 28th year of teaching. Um, I speak here in all three capacities. Uh, I'm here to advocate for the select board authorizing the full funding of the school department, which excuse, excuse me, this is a hearing on uh, on Article Nine. Yeah. Oh, I'm I, sorry, I thought you invited said called me up for. I thought you were having it was, it was on the it was on the one uh, yeah, mm -hmm. at, at, at the very end of the meeting. There'll be an opportunity for public comment. Sorry, but okay. we're, we're almost there. Uh, <laughs> we're almost there. <laughs> we'll let you. We'll let you. We'll, no, it's okay. We'll let you begin again. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, folks on Zoom can use the hand raiser Q&A feature to let us know that they'd like to make a public comment at this time. Um, and Bernard, just let us know if anybody in the room, if anyone else in the room would like to speak on this issue. Uh, there are 17 uh, there's no 10. one in the room that's uh, indicated a desire to uh, speak. Okay. Uh, we have 17 attendees in Zoom and no one is using the hand raise or Q&A feature at this point to indicate they'd like to make a comment. Okay, I'll close the hearing then. Uh, any further questions from the select board? Um, is is this uh, something that we feel comfortable voting tonight? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, then I move approval of uh, Article Nine. I'm sorry, favorable action on Article Nine, establishing a an accrued liabilities reserve. Uh, on favor, please indicate by saying aye. John Van Skoyak. Aye. Mary Ashkenazi. Aye. Michael Sandman. Aye. Paul Warren. Aye. And chair votes aye. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Next is Article 18, resolution to create a social wealth fund study committee. Uh, Mr. Buno, a town meeting member from Precinct 17. 
I apologize if that's not an. Uh, it's all right. You did better than most. I appreciate okay. it. All right. Anthony Buono, town meeting member, Precinct 17. Can you hear me all right? Is that all right? All right, cool. So um, I want to go in and just give my little spiel about kind of what it is and uh, the philosophy that goes on behind something like this. And then I want to take as many questions as you guys have related to it. So hi, everybody. Today, I'm here to introduce you all to the idea of a social wealth fund and my proposal to create one here in Brookline. This will be a transformative approach to collective prosperity and pave the way for more equitable and financially secure future for our community. Before I go into what is a social wealth fund and the details of my proposal, I want to begin with where this idea stems from and the philosophy behind it. It's no secret to everyone in this room that the wealth born of our nation's economic growth does not magically trickle down to the average American. For far too long, we have not tackled the difficult question of how to effectively make the working and middle class people in towns like ours benefit from our nation's expansion. Currently, it is large corporations that reap the benefits of our economic progress, progress that is only made possible by our infrastructure, judicial system, human capital, educational institutions, and vibrant democracy, all of which are built off the backs of, of the progress of America's collective achievements. The working class in towns like ours built our infrastructure, educated our children, and nurtured our institutions. And yet, when corporate stock prices go up, local, local working class people in communities like ours feel almost none of it. What I'm proposing today will act as a small but necessary step to realign our economy. Uh, a Brookline Social Wealth Fund will bring the benefits of our nation's economy back home to communities like ours where it belongs. So what is a social wealth fund? A social wealth fund is when a government invests a portion of its revenues and uses the generated capital returns to address social inequities. This is not a new or radical idea. Countries and states have been operating social wealth funds for years to generate frequent and consistent revenue to better their citizens' lives. The French Deposits and Consignments Fund was created back in 1816 and directly invests government revenues into the market to ensure long-term growth and sustainability. Similar systems currently like exist in the United States. A Brookline Social Wealth Fund will do multiple things. First, it will help us accumulate the resources necessary to combat poverty. Second, it will improve Brookline's financial position by ensuring the longevity of our AAA bond rating. And third, it will generate these benefits without continuous tax increases. So what is the plan specifically? Well, that is where the study committee has to come into play. I must admit, I am not an expert on municipal finance or the intricate legal regulations that need to be abided by to make an investment fund like this from the ground up. However, I have developed a general plan that can be a starting point for the study committee to launch off of. First, we have to create the fund. Under Chapter 40, Section 5B of Massachusetts state law, municipalities can set up special purpose stabilization funds to save and invest money for any use desired by the locality. Berlin, Lowell, and Cahasset have all opened special purpose stabilization funds through this provision, although they do not currently invest their funds in higher yield assets. After we create this fund, we must identify a funding source and invest the money. The specifics of both of these points will be the subject of the study committee itself, but I want to give some estimations of what the town could accomplish through my preliminary outline. With minimal withdrawals from the fund over a 50-year time frame, with responsible funding, the Brookline Social Wealth Fund can accumulate around $823 million, assuming we can capture the average market rate of return. Adjusted for 3% inflation, that is $182 million. This rate of return will depend on if the finance department slash study committee can build out a diversified portfolio of high yield assets from the list of legal municipality investments under Chapter 167F, Section 3 points 1 through 5. Um, if needed, I can run through those five points of the different things we're allowed to invest in through the stabilization fund. After putting this money away for 50 years, we would be able to take out 3.5% of our Brookline Social Wealth Fund every year in perpetuity without the value of the Social Wealth Fund ever decreasing. This is because our withdrawal rate will be less than our growth rate plus inflation rate. This will be approximately $6.3 million annually adjusted for that 3% inflation. What can we do with all this? Well, we can fight for social justice. We will allocate this money to close the equity gap in our community wherever it exists, putting the municipality on the front lines of reducing poverty. So much falls on the shoulders of the municipal government. We are tasked to do everything from educating our children to running emergency services, addressing housing inequalities, mental health struggles, business development, and so much more. We are struggling to do everything and we're struggling to fund it all. This charts a new path. Instead of raising taxes incessantly to fund social programs, we will have an income generating fund that will always be there to fight for social justice no matter what. Is it worth it? In my preliminary outline, Brookline will be investing $19 million in inflation adjusted dollars over the 50 years. In the 51st year, Brookline can begin withdrawing $6.3 million, meaning after 50 years of investing, Brookline makes all of its money back in three years, 
And then after that, if the US is still around and the market keeps growing, it's continuous profit forever. How will we fund it? This will be the main topic of the study committee. It may be through allocating a small portion of income generated from new commercial development or general revenue through free cash. It has to depend, but this will be the topic of the study committee. I want the funding to come from a responsible and reliable place. There is no reason that this program should financially burden the town as the goal is to give us financial freedom, not the opposite. I want to make it uh, clear in my explainer attached to my Warren article. I specifically mentioned the priority of funding the pension, the unfunded pension liabilities and the um, other post-employment benefit stuff. I make it specifically clear that until certain th metrics are hit, funding should not exceed a certain amount. If we invest now, we will reap enormous rewards in the decades to come. This will be an example to the nation, an example how to bring our nation's economic output to the communities that built it. This is a path to make the people get their fair share of the economy that they helped create. I understand that it's hard to comprehend and appreciate the benefits of something that I'm suggesting is 50 years away, but I want to remind everyone of FDR's fight to enact Social Security. Countless advisors warned him that creating such a program at that time was useless. They, wa they warned it would not be politically popular. They warned it wouldn't do anything to attack the issues of the day. They warned it could be deflationary by pulling money out of general circulation. FDR rebuked these criticisms as he saw the larger picture of what he was attempting to build. A future where the government was there to catch you when you fall, to aid you when you are sick, and to let you retire with dignity. We take this for granted today, but it was FDR's decision in 1935, when the economy had hardly recovered, to look beyond the current moment and plan for the future generations. When advisors hounded him to postpone the enactment of Social Security due to immediate concerns, FDR responded with, we can't help that, we have to get it started, or it will never start. Let us, let us harness that energy here and recognize the urgent need to plan for the future that we want to make. A society grows great when old men plant trees in whose shade they shall never sit. So let us take a small step towards building a better future where we have the resources to fight for social equity the way it deserves to be fought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have... Can I ask the first question? I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he, he seems so... Um, is there an, a state other than Alaska that has a social service fund? Yeah, there's one in West Virginia, North West Dakota, Virginia, West Virginia, wow, North that Dakota, me. <laughs> and West Virginia, North Dakota. A lot of the government protocols that I have in my explainer is from the North Dakota Legacy Fund, and Texas has one for their school system as well. Okay, thank you, uh, Miriam. Okay, so first, I just have to say that we can't talk about Social Security and FDR without please giving a nod to Francis Perkins. Uh, yep. Love Francis Perkins. <laughs> Shout out to her. Yep. The Department of Labor. And local Back wouldn't have happened without her. This whole plan and convinced him to do it. Um, and I am not overstating that. Um, I have a couple of, uh, uh, I have a recommendation. I, I actually think, I think it's an idea worth exploring. I think it's, it, uh, it's not a heavy lift to have a study committee um, in something that I think, you know, is at least worth talking about. My recommendation to you would be for the now therefore clause to be more specific about who you, how many people should be on this committee. Give us a little more guidance. It makes it much easier for the select board. Um, I mean, it could be seven to nine. It doesn't have to be very prescriptive, but it's very, very vague now. Okay. So if you know what the other committees look like or have looked like in the past, a little guidance for the select board if they were to then adopt this. Will do. Thanks. Uh, Mike, do you have your hand? Yeah, I, I do. <clears throat> so um, first of all, um, uh, you and I have talked about this uh, really uh, going back to the town meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the time I thought, uh, well, this is interesting, but I, I didn't think it was feasible. And I think I expressed that to you. Uh, and uh, regrettably, my, my view hasn't changed very much. Um, it is interesting. And feasibility is really uh, open to uh, open the question. One of the differences between uh, Social Security being enacted by the federal government and uh, what you're talking about is that the federal government doesn't need to balance its budget. Uh, and certainly, and FDR was an exemplar of not doing that for good purpose. No question about it. I'm a Keynesian, after all. So it certainly was was uh, 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 certainly what what he did was uh, uh, was really magnificent. But um, that's not something that we can, you know, we have to have a, a balanced budget. And you've been sitting here this evening and you listen, and very patiently, I must say, you listen to Council on Aging talking about the needs that it's going to have. 
We had the discussion about the reserves that we need to increase in order to keep our uh, AAA rating. And I, I'm not sure whether something that's invested for uh, with a commitment of not taking any money out for 50 years would have the same uh, resonate in the same way with, uh, with with the rating agency. I will say in the I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's right. Uh, the schools uh, we've had, uh, I think all each of us have had somewhere around 120 emails asking us to quote fully fund the schools, even though we have uh, fully funded the schools to the extent that we can. Uh, and uh, you've heard the discussion about pub the, from public safety, uh, the needs of the fire department. Uh, goes on and on. Uh, and so the feasibility is it's is 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 open to question. Uh, and uh, I would just um, caution you on making estimates based on trends that uh, a trend over fifty years is um, you know, there will be inflation over fifty years, what that what the average rate will be, what the average rate of return in the market will be is. Uh, Difficult to hang your hat on, and particularly, uh, I would caution you about um, thinking that we can invest in high rate of return assets within the framework that we are allowed uh, any more than we do now with our existing uh, pension funds. So um, when you're presenting this at town meeting, please be careful uh, to really hone your uh, um, your predictions based on the, you know, take a careful look at the rates that you're using um, uh, because you'll have a lot of people in town meeting who will know a great deal uh, about rates of return and um, some of them will ask you some some difficult questions if you're not careful. I will say the, the rate I used was just the S&P return since 1929. That was the rate that I used for the... Right assumption there right. um the before or after the stock market crash before what was starting before yeah i think so okay um i want to i want to outline here so <laughs> let's see if there's more do we want to keep going up? We oh, sorry yeah oh wait yeah you, you were gonna answer i think a question that was i don't really know there was a question in there but <laughs> <laughs> well okay yeah right. um well, uh, John, John had his really? oh, oh, don't fight over what repeat, repeat for us. What is the rate of return that you're assuming here? 10 percent. Whoa, well, 10.26 <laughs> is the SP 500 return since 29. Can the rest of us get in on this? Uh, you say you can, yeah, you can, yeah, 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 Saving bank investment funds are allowed to be 50% of the overall portfolio. So from my understanding, I'm not a lawyer, but that can get us to around 65% of stuff that is at least involved in the market. Now, saving bank investment funds, there are aggressive saving bank investment funds that do take advantage of, of uh, you know general equity markets. So I think that that could get us not to 10, but maybe to seven and eight. And that still makes the thing totally viable. If, if if you don't mind my asking, do you start personally invest uh, in the stock market or? Well, yeah, I things? have my retirement account. Are you getting ten percent annual rate of return? About. You are. Yeah. Well, good for you. I mean, we'll put you in, put well, you in charge of the fund. All you have uh, to do is invest in the S and P, and then you get it. It's I mean, well, it depends on the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a question of what can what what can be a, a guaranteed rate and and uh, uh over 50 i don't know years I, I don't know anybody who's guaranteeing 10 percent a year over 50 years but anyway um uh truthfully what worries me about all of this i, I there's no there's no nothing wrong with the idea of warren buffett has phrase get rich slowly you know um get rich slowly you know put put aside a bunch of money at the beginning wait 50 years it'll grow into a blah blah you know etc 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 um what what i'm worried about is the way that you have package this and the rhetoric you're using uh, makes it sound like you're saying um, people can get rich uh, by doing, you know, ba basically without having to actually put anything at risk. Um, and th th this is, you know, absolutely putting money at risk. And it, it also, you know, sort of creates a notion that we will solve all our problems if 50 years from now, 
we have so much money set aside that we get a six million dollars return on it. I mean, six we can withdraw six million dollars on it every year. Fifty years from now, I I don't think six million is going to go all that far. No, it's six million inflation adjusted. So it's six well, million in today's dollars. It's a two percent increase in our overall budget. Yeah, right. I, I think I think we're saying the same thing. Well, yeah. six million dollars is not won't go a long way. I'm saying six million dollars in 2024 cash, not six million dollars in future cash. Yeah, and future cash in nominal terms is 28 million, but I didn't. That number doesn't mean much. Yeah. So it's six mil, six point three million in real adjusted terms. Yeah, um, but but um, what about the 19 million that you have to come up with at the beginning? Uh, not at the beginning. So at the beginning, my funding mechanism that I very is a very preliminary outline that is not hold to the resolution at all. It's just to mm. showcase the possibility of what can be accomplished is 0.07% of the town's revenue invested every year. Mm -hmm. That is $250,000. Once the pensions liability is fully funded, we increase that 0.07 to 0.1 to 0.14 of percent of town revenue. Get us closer to 300,000 to 500,000 invested each year. After 50 years, it accumulates 19 million invested over 50 years all real adjusted for 2023 dollars and then we make our money back three years after so really it genuinely does pay for itself it's the same thing as get one marshmallow now or three later uh other people can look at your math i don't think it i don't think it bears out i did some quick math just with a savings calculator here it didn't it didn't even come close to adding do? up to the kind of numbers that you're talking about you know um uh you know plugging in the the beginning amount the the amount the invested amounts over the, and i put in a realistic number as to you know what you might get as a return which is what most people use these days on our own retirement portfolios we have been lowering the anticipated rate to bring it into a realistic range. What range? It's now in the range of about 6%. If we're talking and, about 6%. And even that, we're, we're not necessarily staying with it. We've had some good years, yes. but you know, we'll probably have some bad years. So 6% makes a lot of sense because most of the time when you're talking about retirement planning, you want to, you want to view your calculations of what you're going to have post um, inflation. So if you account, account for inflation, all my calculations, it's a growth rate of 7%. Right. If if we account for inflation, I'm talking about a seven percent gross rate minus the when we take out the inflation stuff. Um, I, I I can send you the spreadsheet too. I want no, you. I'm, to not, I'm not that. In, I, I I don't believe in this kind of financing of government okay. operations. Okay. I, I just don't. So you, you know. But, and by the way, it's it's Bill Spitz, not Warren Buffett, who talked about get rich. So. Well, I'll stand corrected. <laughs> oh, uh, there's one more point too. On the second page of my explainer, I do make it very clear about the risks. I actually underlined it. I said, by investing in corporate equities and index funds, there is a risk of loss of principal if as performance is not guaranteed, of, uh, as past performance is no guarantee of future results. In addition, there will be fees charged for all transactions that could pack annual yield. So I did include the risk. I did not mislead that part. Well, <clears throat> so, uh, first, I would say, I, one, I appreciate you bringing this forward in the creativity. And I, I'm going to say, you know, sincerely, when I can find something that I really want to have put through a town meeting, I'm going to get you to help me because, <laughs> because you have passion, you know the details, you present well, um, and, and I can see that you really want Thank to get you. this done. So that's, that is a sincere compliment. Um, but I'm, I, I want to get away from the numbers and the rate of returns and everything and just, and just say, I do not believe that this is the role of our municipal government. Um, I don't believe that that Brookline uh, should play a role as Fidelity Investments, um, you know, as, as a taxpayer. Um, I, 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 me personally, um, I don't want to write checks for someone to invest for me. I want them to fix the roads, fill the potholes, hire the teacher, make sure the trash is picked up on time. Uh, hire librarians, uh, make sure that we can, uh, you know, transport seniors from place to place, on and on and on and on. I think Mike Mike kind of gave you the list. But but again, I don't and I don't say that in jest. I just want to say I do not believe that this is the role of our government, um, and therefore I'm unable to support the concept of even studying it because I don't believe that the idea is correct uh, for 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 what we should be doing. So I I can't support it. But again. Um, I'm going to find something I have I really need to get past the finish line because you're, you're you are really doing a great job. But I, um, I, I, I appreciate your approach and your values. Um, I just don't think it's the role of our government. OK, um, 
<laughs> can I make it last for you? That's your, I can't resist. Okay. Uh, and I, I, th I thank Bernard for correcting me on who, who, who had that. It, quote, it's, but, it's a piece of useless information that clutters my brain. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> no but but I, want, I want to mention the last person who made headlines for promising people that he could make 10% a year. And it was Bernie I'm Madoff. I'm not promising you could. It was Bernie Madoff. That's not what I'm promising, though. That's it was not Bernie Madoff. We know what happened to him. And I'm not investment. promising a 10% <laughs> every year. That's not yeah. what I'm suggesting in my calculations. I'm yeah, suggesting yeah, yeah, yeah. a 20% annual average, which means 20% loss one year, 30% gain one year, whatever. It goes up and down. I'm not saying 20% gain, 10% gain every year. That's but do you understand the gravity of, oh. of, of proposing to take people's tax dollars mm -hmm on the assumption that they will over time be able to get 10% on it. The investors who invest in those kinds of schemes often lose everything, you know. Not, no, and, no, that's, you not, know, but we, we, that's not we accurate. We take employee employees exactly. tax dollars Thank you. and put them in pension funds. Thank you. I mean, you know, in, well, we don't tell in contributory pension funds. You know, you, you're right. We guarantee them 7% a year. Yeah. 6.9% <laughs> is the last actuarial figure from the last report was 6.9%. And by the way, but, that's a guarantee that if it comes up short, we have to make up the difference. So that's how we. And, and what's beautiful about my proposal is that you don't have to make up the difference. Yeah. <laughs> then we're not going to make. Okay. Up. Quick comment. So I think it's clear. I'm probably going to be the only one supporting this, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that I think we're getting into the weeds here, which to me, ex I, I, except for Paul's comment, which I think is, is an irrelevant, but not <laughs> to what I'm about to say. I think you make a relevant point. I don't agree with it, but that's, I mean, that's, that's okay. That's the way it is. I mean, yeah, that's okay. But to, to everything else, we're getting in the weeds, right? And to me, that's what a study committee is for getting in the weeds, because there is clearly something here to, to figure out. And there are other states and communities that have done this successfully. So to me, a study committee is just about that. Let's look at all those other places and see how they did it and see how it's working out for them and learn from them. And maybe even if we don't go this way, maybe it'll show us another way. So that's why I'm supporting it to be clear. I don't know that this is going to work or not. I don't know what the rate of return is. I definitely get better than 6.9% on my own investments. So we can talk, John. Um, but, <laughs> but, but I think it's worth investigating because we have examples of other successful uh, social welfare funds. So that's just, okay. that's what I'm saying. And, and by the way, um, yeah, I, I disagree with Paul that this is not a proper purpose of municipality. I don't um, I think it's a good point. Sorry, Bernard. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, subject to, you know, what it is that you use the money for, and, you know, because we have limitations mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, my concern is that you're talking about something that's not going to come into being yeah. in 50 years. And for me, you know, I'm like the Keynesian, mm -hmm. you know, guy who's going to be dead in, in the long term. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I I I, oh, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it just needs a lot more thought. Um, that's exactly why a study committee, I think, is yeah. the perfect place for this. And the fifty-year time thing, I, that's a, that's just something you know that that was my calculation to make it give the good presentation. It doesn't have to be fifty years. The study committee can say fifty years is unreasonable. Um, I also want to add one thing to what Paul said. Um, when we talk about um, bringing new ideas into the national focus, it's very very difficult to take things from the citizen's mind and get it thought through and action made at the state and federal level especially. What municipal governments are when they're at their best is being the laboratories of democracy that Justice Brandeis wanted them to be. And so what I think this does, at least by having the study committee, is taking up the true role of local government that is as close to the people as you can possibly get and say, this is something that the people are interested in this is something we want to see here. We're going to do our best to make it in our own community, and we can export that to the state and to the national government eventually. So I understand if you don't think it's the right place for the locality, but this is how we get it on a national stage. Okay, this is a uh, <laughs> this is a public hearing, <laughs> um, and I see one hand raised in in the in the uh, room here, <laughs> Regina. <clears throat> Regina Frawley, town meeting member from South Brookline, Precinct 16. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, I think Lincoln should be hiring this guy if he can deliver that kind of percentage increase because I sit through a lot of these meetings and it doesn't even come close to that. But I'll tell you, uh, the question I have, I have a couple. One, 
where is this money going to be generated from? What little paperwork I had did not tell me that. And number two, the one paperwork I did have said, and it wouldn't be too burdensome to people on fixed income. That was grave concern to me because I'm not sure I, I would trust a kid to tell me what's too burdensome, to be perfectly honest. But I, would I will like point out that there is no law in Massachusetts against age discrimination against people under 40. But as someone under 40, I've experienced it a number of times. <laughs> Please don't discriminate against them on the basis of- All right. Age. Then this petitioner- um, wrote that, and I would like to know what he has presumed to be an acceptable damage for people on fixed incomes, especially low fixed incomes. So those are two questions. Fantastic question. Thank you. I'm going to answer your second one first because it's fresher in my mind. The, the reason I mentioned that it wasn't burdensome on fixed income is because we're going to be able to raise expenditures of the town without having to increase property taxes. That's that's what's happening with the funds that's getting generated from the market itself. So because we don't have to, we're, we're going to increase the net expenditure of the town without having to do an override to say, you know what I'm saying? That's why. I should have just said burdensome. I apologize. Um, okay. And then the first question was, how will we fund it? That is the topic of the study committee. I do not pretend to be an expert in municipal finance. I want, I don't want to have to, I don't want to make that decision. I don't feel comfortable that I'm knowledgeable enough and I accept that fully. And I wanted more and better input people who have more and a better understanding of the municipal finance system to get that information. Okay. Uh, Charlie. Oops. Thanks. Bernard, um, so yeah. folks in the audience can use the hand raise or Q&A feature to let us know they'd like to make a comment in this public hearing. Um, so again, just use the hand raise feature or put something in the Q&A. Uh, we have 15 attendees. Okay. I'm seeing Neil Gordon has his hand up. I'm promoting him to a panelist now. Neil Gordon. Oh, yeah. Great. Neil, you've been promoted to a panelist. You may uh, share your camera and unmute, and you'll have three minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, so the advisory subcommittee, uh, school subcommittee, had a public hearing. And Who are meeting. you, please? Who are you, please? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm Neil Gordon. I'm a Precinct One Town meeting member and a member of the advisory committee. Um, the school subcommittee of advisory had a public hearing and meeting uh, on this particular Warren article, and they too went right to the weeds. Um, the article calls for a study, uh, and uh, it, it seems to me that this discussion and the school subcommittee discussion uh, was about who's going to invest, who has the talent. This was the school subcommittee. Um, do, do, who's going to be the investment advisor? Um, the discussion, it seems to me, is a discussion of the Warren article that may or may not be brought uh, six months, 12 months, 24 months from now, uh, after or not at all, uh, depending upon what the report of uh, this particular study committee concludes. As I said to the uh, school subcommittee, um, we hear all the time that the town needs to do some long-term financial planning. And I think that this uh, proposed committee uh, as we look at, hopefully, the uh, expiration of payments for OPEBs, the expiration of payments for unfunded pension liability, um, long term, there is this opportunity to use funds that are now directed to those two uh, unfunded liabilities and at least ponder what we might do. But yet the subcommittee and the uh, conversation that I've heard this evening has been about, well, how realistic is the return? Um, how realistic is the return is the subject of um, a future date. Thank you, Miriam, for keeping the, uh, uh, the, the notion of this conversation within the scope of the Warren article, which I support. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Folks in the audience can use the hand raise or Q&A feature. Mm -hmm. Um, I have not seen anyone else uh, let us know that they would like to make a comment, Bernard. We have 14 attendees, and no one is using the hand raiser Q&A feature at this time. 
Okay. Um, I don't see anyone in the um, auditorium here uh, raising their hands. Uh, so I'll, I will close the hearing. Uh, you have any final words? Um, I appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation mm -hmm. with me. I really greatly appreciate it. All of you, Michael Salmon, thank you for the long email chains that we've shared even late into the night. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I hope this Warren article earns your support. Um, I hope if there's any more clarifying questions that I could have, please feel free to email me. I want to, I want this to be a partnership between all of you and not just me, because obviously I want it to be successful and have legs and longevity. And that is only accomplished with consensus and not just a single person. So thank you so much. Right. And this is a article that we will not vote on tonight, but at, at a future meeting, um, which will give people time to uh, have that email correspondence uh, with the uh, petitioner uh, and um, come up with other questions. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay, next, uh, uh, Warren articles that uh, we have taken up in the past and are on our agenda for a vote tonight. Warren article 15, uh, create a new general bylaw establishing staggered terms of office for constables. Uh, Neil Gordon is here, but uh, you know we just need to discuss it among ourselves and see if we're ready to vote. Any any discussion? I can make a quick uh, yeah. statement, Bernard. I um I I appreciate Neil bringing this. I think he made a good case for uh, staggering the terms so that you know um, the people are actually aware that constables uh, um, exist. Uh, <laughs> right. That that they um, that you know moving it to staggered terms would bring up. Uh, an election every year, as opposed to the way it is, uh, I think every three years right now, and um, creates an opportunity for some mentorship uh, for you know new uh, new constables. So um, I supported it. Makes a lot of okay. sense. Okay, uh, I will move favorable action on warrant. Yeah, excuse me, warrant article fifteen. On favor, please indicate by saying aye. John Van Skoyak. Aye. <clears throat> Mary Mashkinazi. Thank you, Neil Gordon, and I. <laughs> um, let's see, Michael Sandman. Aye. Uh, Paul Warren. Aye. And Chair votes aye. <clears throat> okay, Article 16. This is John Van Skoyak's article. Um, amend 3.14.1 of the General Bylaws to change the number of Commission for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Community Relations members from 15 to 9. Uh, any discussion? Just an update. Okay. Uh, the advisory committee subcommittee voted unanimously in favor last night. Great. Okay. Good. Um, I move a pr uh, favorable action on warrant article 16. 16. On favor, please indicate by saying aye. Uh, John Van Skoyak. Aye. Mary Mashkenazi. Aye. Uh, Mike Sandman. Aye. <clears throat> Paul Warren. Aye. And chair votes aye. And that is the end of our agenda. We can now take uh, comments from the audience. We do have someone signed up, Regina. Yeah, we have Sorry. someone signed up. Yeah. This is Liz Harmon. And we yeah, have one other you. person. Sorry. We have one other person signed up after that. Um, okay. okay. <laughs> All right, I'll start again. <laughs> All right, start again. <laughs> uh, my name is Liz Gorman. Uh, thank you, members of the Select Board, for your service to this town and for listening to my public comment tonight. Um, I am also, I'm a longtime Brookline resident, a uh, parent of two Brookline public schools educated children, and um, I'm also a longtime Spanish teacher at Brookline High School. This is my 28th year of teaching, and I speak here related to all three capacities. Um, I'm here to advocate for the select board authorizing the full funding of the school department, which is facing a $3 million gap or budget deficit with the understanding that it is the select board who has the capacity to authorize more funding, whether from the, the certified free cash that I know that you addressed earlier or from elsewhere. In the long history of my years here, I have seen there have been times when the town and the school have come together to discuss to find ways to fund um, unfunded issues. Um, I also hope that each of you will be compelled after listening to me to urge the school committee to postpone their budget decision and to follow through on their promises to the voters um, of this town. I'm particularly concerned, sad, and angry about the possible loss of the K-5 World Language Program. Along with other taxpayers and your constituents in this town, I voted for an override first in 2009 to create and sustain a K-5 World Language Program. 
Very few communities have elementary programs, and this is one of the things that distinguishes us. This brings people to our town. Um, my friends with children in other communities envy us for this reason, and cutting this program would be a huge loss. There are many, many benefits to a young person to learning for learning a foreign language, ranging from increased economic opportunities it allows them down the road to a host mm. of unique brain development that it allows to the increased cultural sensitivity and cross-cultural understanding. This community has always gone against the grain in value, valuing multilingualism, unlike much of the United States, and it is something I have always loved about this town as a parent, as a resident. As a high school teacher, I remember clearly the first five to six years that the students from the K-8 to started arriving after the creation of this World of Language program, each year with more language, each year we revised, enriched, and ultimately rewrote our entire curriculums to respond to the growing skills that the students were bringing. The impact of starting younger is significant. What I can do with my Spanish for students is fundamentally different from my colleagues in other districts. We speak you have about 30 seconds. Okay. Um, we speak about curriculum and it's clear that we are working on a different level. Um, in Again, in 2023, I voted alongside the other residents of this town to invest specifically in the K-5 to program to hire a consultant to help us redesign and improve the program. A clear vote to invest in it. Rather than putting the recommendations in place, we find it at risk of being fully eliminated, and I am dismayed. It would be a huge loss for our educational system. It is also just wrong to go against the voters' wishes, who not once but twice have voted to invest in this program. Please Your do not time let has expired. progress. Um, be cut entirely. I close asking you to um, thank you, thank you, fund a school system, and thank you for your time thank and you. consideration. The next person signed thank up you. for public comment is Allison Kerr. Allison um, is online. I'm going to promote Allison now. Um, and Allison is the last person that we had signed up in advance. Um, Allison, you've been promoted to a panelist. You may unmute and share your video, and your three minutes will begin. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Allison Kerr. I'm in my sixth year as a French teacher in Brookline, transitioning this year to the high school um, after five years in the K-8 to programs. I'm here to respectfully ask you to do everything in your power to preserve the K-5 to World Language Program to the greatest extent possible, as well as the ed tech specialists, literacy coaches, and school secretaries, among other roles that are on the chopping block due to budget constraints this year. These roles directly influence the day-to-day -day functions of our school, and we should do everything we can to preserve them. Having listened earlier this evening, I have heard that you feel your role as select board has been misunderstood or your priorities mischaracterized, and that's not my goal this evening. I do hope, um, despite your frustrations, that you're available to my request um, in, in addressing the issues I present this evening. Um, currently, the K-8 to schools each offer one language K-5, to Chinese or Spanish, and a choice of two languages in 6-8, to eight, either Chinese mm. and Spanish or Spanish and French. Last Thursday at the school committee meeting, Dr. Fortuna recommended cutting the K-5 to program in its entirety. I believe her recommendation is misguided, and I hope you will urge the school committee to reconsider before their vote on March 28th or delay their vote until there is more time given to this discussion. While many school committee members seem to discuss eliminating the program as a foregone conclusion, some school committee members also remarked how drastic and sudden this decision felt, that while they had been discussing the budget shortfall for a while, discussions around in cutting six years of a program had only been introduced last Thursday. Dr. Fortuna referenced the review completed by Thomas Sauer and Pearl as a justification for the cut. Ignoring many of the assets Mr. Sauer identified in the program and instead focusing on findings that taken out of context could justify cuts. One such example of information taken out of context is comparing students' proficiency in six to eight with that of students after K to eight without the nuance of how many minutes of instruction per year students are getting at the different levels of K to five or considering how students entering French in sixth grade have a wealth of knowledge and skill sets and study habits established in the K to five that propel them forward in their French language acquisition. We would be remiss to underestimate or understate the influence of K-5 to Spanish on students' language development and K-5 to Chinese on students' language development, regardless of their choice in high school and middle school. Rather than refine the program and make it sustainable using Mr. Sauer's recommendations, the district proposes losing all of the progress this program has made since its creation, years of curriculum development and professional development, and recently tens of thousands of dollars that Thomas Sauer and Pearl have been paid this year to implement the changes he suggested. It you would have be 30 seconds. 
such a shame to effectively waste all the money taxpayers have voted to support this program by cutting the entire K-5 program without allowing a single year for these changes to be implement implemented. World language education has a direct impact on students' intercultural proficiency, which is so important in a globalized 21st century. I urge you to fight for this program to the extent that you're able by providing necessary funding or by advocating to school committee to consider, re-examine, reconsider, and possibly delay their vote after March 28th so more discussion around this can take place. Um, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Regina, I think you're next, unless there's someone else. Um, Ms. Riley, I just know you, you spoke at the beginning of the meeting. You have two and a half minutes. Okay. Uh, actually, I rise for exactly that reason. I wonder if there's any way to balance those of us who sign up in person, who shouldn't be put at the end of the line, in my opinion, because we took the time to physically be here and not just prioritize those who use the computer to sign early. We shouldn't have to be in that position. I wonder if we could alternate them from those who are present versus those who are also online. And clearly the majority is online. So that's my comment and it's my request. Thank you. Thank you. And that's something you could respond to, I would imagine. Well, we give it some thought, um, you know, Someone's saying no <laughs> over there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll give it. Some, we'll give it thought. What I'll what I'll what I'll note is that yeah. what I'll note is that anyone who wants to sign up can sign up by a phone or email or any other means, any other electronic means. It's not limited just to email. Um, obviously, people can come to town hall and sign up. Um, so we pri we provide a variety of opportunities, and obviously, if someone requests a reasonable accommodation, we're happy to provide a reasonable accommodation. Um, but again, the point of the sign up is to allow people to, you know, allow folks, regardless of the method they use to sign up, to speak in the order in which they sign up. Uh, and we don't think that discriminates against folks who show up here in person because they can use the phone or email or any other means to sign up beforehand if they so desire. Okay. And that is the end of the meeting. Uh, so the meeting is over. Thank you, everyone.